Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to call to order the City Council meeting for the afternoon of October 17th. Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Duan? Present. Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kamei? Mayhem? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right, now if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Today's invocation will be provided by Pastor Tyler Cole of the Lincoln Glen Church, and Council Member Foley will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. For today's invocation, I've invited Tyler Cole, Cole the lead pastor of Lincoln Glen Church, located in South Willow Glen of District 9. The Lincoln Glen Church has played a key role in our community since 1940, including the creation of the Lincoln Glen Manor, which is the senior care facility located right beside the church. Pastor Cole, who became a pastor of the church in January of 2019, has helped lead numerous events where all, where all in the community are welcome. Some of these events include block parties, food drives, blood drives, filling hygiene kits for the unhoused, and so much more. The Lincoln Glen Church continues its efforts to support local families with emotional, physical, financial, and mental health needs, in addition to supporting other pastors and small churches. And as a side personal note, Pastor Cole presented us all with a nice thank you note and appreciation for all the work that we have done on council. I am grateful to you so much for the work that you do in our community and for the words and inspiration that you have guided me with over the years. And with that, I'd like to welcome Tyler, Pastor Cole to say a few words. Thank you, Council Member Foley, and thank you for all that, all that you do, you and your staff, all you Council Members, Mayor Mahan, thank you. Uh, as I was trying to think about what to share uh, this morning, I, I, I looked at the agenda and I saw that there was going to be an honoring of national dis or disability awareness, uh, employment awareness. And it just it sparked uh, a verse in my mind, uh, which is Genesis 1, It comes in the very beginning of the Bible. And it says, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And I, I grew up going to church my whole life. And I think when you grow up in something, you get, should I get closer? All right. All right. Thank you. When you, uh, so I'll, I'll say the verse again, the Genesis 1, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I grew up going to church. I heard this all the time. I think when you grow up hearing something, uh, it just becomes routine. And it wasn't until later in life, uh, I was talking to my pastor about someone who was bothering me a lot. And uh, he said, you know, that person that's driving you crazy was made in the image of God just as much as you. And I think it was in that moment that I realized it's not just the people that I think, that think like me. It's not just the people who look like me. It's not just the people who I like, who vote like me, whatever it may be, that are created in the image of God. It's every single human being. Every single human being has value, worth, and dignity because they're created in God's image. That's what we learn in the very beginning of Scripture. That's the truth that I happen to, to believe. And so as I saw the agenda that there's topics of, of how do we help homeless people in San Jose, how can we honor and, and protect those with disabilities, that verse came to mind that every single person has value and honor and dignity and worth, not because of our accomplishments, because of our resumes, but every single person is loved and has value because they are created in the image of God. And so my hope is as city leaders and as citizens that we can actually treat each other that way, not just believe it in our head, but actually live it out in the way that we live. And so that's my hope and my prayer, and I just want to say a little prayer in light of that. Lord, I, I thank you that you have created us in your image, that we have value, dignity, and worth because of that. Lord, every single one of us, that both Israelis and Palestinians are created equally in your image, that both Republicans and Democrats are created equally in your image, 
those that have a place to call home in this city and those that do not are created equally in your image. Those that may be more able-bodied than others and those that may have disabilities are created equally in your image. And Lord, may we treat each other that way with honor and dignity and respect because everyone is worthy of that. Lord, I pray that you guide our city leaders as they attempt to serve and to lead. Lord, bless them and their families. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Certainly a very timely reflection on our shared humanity. Um, we're going to move on to our ceremonial items, and we'll start with Vice Mayor Kamei and Council Member Foley. If you would join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us here today. I am proud to be joined today by Council Member Pam Foley, who has done this proclamation annually and has representatives and clients of Ability Path to proclaim October as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. National Disability Awareness Employment Awareness Month has been recognized across the country in order to celebrate the contributions of people with disabilities to the economy and workplaces, as well as to educate people on the challenges disabled employees face and to promote inclusive hiring practices. People with disabilities have inherent worth and value that must be recognized across our society, yet they have long been marginalized and sidelined in the workplace. From the lack of necessary accommodation to disrespect and discrimination to outright denial of employment and promotion opportunities, people with disabilities deserve better. They deserve full, equal access to our economy, the ability to live with dignity in whatever they do, and the freedom to reach their full potential. Few organizations embody and carry this mission as passionately and effectively as Ability Path. They are a trailblazing nonprofit dedicated to ensuring people with disabilities can achieve their full potential. Among their many programs, Ability Path provides job training and placement, independent living skills, and online courses to people with disabilities. They also work with children and families to support their development and ensure they have the resources necessary to thrive. I am proud to have Ability Path representatives and clients here today to receive this proclamation from the City of San Jose. Thank you for being here and thank you for all the work you do. So, <laughs> sorry, but for the incredible team here, uh, not only our staff, but also the folks in employment, yeah, I want to thank the mayor, vice mayor, and council members for the recognition. For so many employers, for empowering the people that we serve to have jobs and employment. I want to mention something to all of you that you may not realize. We have over 200 folks in employment here in the Santa Clara Valley, and they work tirelessly throughout all of COVID. Incredible employees, not missing a day of work, showing up as critical workers throughout the pandemic. I want to thank all of you for the job that you did. And I'd like to have Marco Pedrisco come up and maybe say a few words, Mayor, if that's okay. Microphone. Hey, um, I, like, I like my job and uh, I've been working at Safeway for five years. Um, I, uh, bag um, uh, groceries, um, I talk to customers, I interact to, for, to customers, 
customers uh, and I um and and, and I interpret uh, and, and and I interpret sometimes and thanks thank you for, for, thank you guys for having me in consideration So thank you again for the partnership and the support, uh, our friends at the San Andreas Regional Center and all the other service providers that are making a difference in the community. And for all of you, you that maybe have an opportunity for employment, you won't be disappointed with the incredible workforce that we have. So again, thank you for the recognition and thank you all of you for your good work. All right, Councilmember Cohen's coming down to recognize the San Jose Clean Energy Team for their award-winning solar access program. Councilmember Cohen. I'll raise the mic too much. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> All right, I want to invite the clean, uh, San Jose Clean Energy Team to come down and join me. Today, we are honoring San Jose Clean Energy for their excellent work in creating the solar access program for our underserved communities. The solar access program received the 2023 Beacon Leadership and Innovation Award from the Institute of Local Government for its outstanding equitable efforts in community outreach and delivering climate resilience. I was honored to be presented with the award by ILG at the League of California Cities convention last month. Nice little uh, trophy that we received. Uh, this comprehensive outreach campaign was in partnership with three community-based organizations, International Children's Assistance Network, uh, Mujeres, I can't speak, I can't pronounce this properly, but the Mujeres Empresarias Tamando Acción, and Alviso Community Fund. Together, they created an exclusive public engagement strategy that resulted in cost savings for over 800 San Jose residents, with savings ranging from $32 to over $100 per month. The solar access program is an excellent example of how we can successfully address climate change while helping our most underserved residents. Thank you to our San Jose Clean Energy team for their leadership on this program, and congratulations for receiving the 2023 Beacon Leadership and Innovation Award. So while the Director of Clean Energy, uh, Lori Mitchell, is out this week, I'm happy we're joined by other members of the team so I can present both this trophy that we received and a commendation on behalf of the City Council and Mayor. Uh, Zach Strzok is here to uh, say a few words. Thank you. I, I really, uh, we really couldn't have done it uh, without the three organizations that Councilmember Cohen uh, mentioned, and um, that that it, their innovation in um, taking. Uh, taking it to the streets in some cases, knocking on doors and helping people fill out applications and literally making thousands of phone calls to make sure that we got um, the broad reach that we wanted to with the program. Also wanted to make sure that um, we highlighted some staff, staff names in addition 
Uh, so I guess it's wrong to name names because you always leave someone out, but Kate Ziemba, Marco Santiago, Sarai Rojas, uh, Manu Rodriguez, Phil Cornish, Taylor Connect, and everyone else. And also wanted to appreciate council for um, uh, uh, the recommendation and, and uh, encouraging us to, to launch and, and do this program. Thanks very much. All right, Councilor Torres now will join me at the podium to proclaim this month as Arts and Humanities Month. Councilor Torres. Today, we as a city proclaim the month of October, my birthday, no, just kidding, <laughs> National Humanities and Arts Month for the City of San Jose as we come together to celebrate in this amazing opportunity to recognize and observe the arts and humanities in our beautiful city. We get to reflect on the impact in which arts and humanities have in our classrooms, libraries, community centers, and on our very streets. Roughly 30 years ago today, the arts and humanity were, cel were celebrated for the first time in 1993 to in initiate a campaign to encourage and motivate Americans to explore new facets of the arts and humanities in their lives. Advocates and government officials come together to reestablish this month and have a focused approach in enabling easier access to the arts of all levels, encouraging more involvement and support in the arts, allow for businesses to show their support, raise awareness about the benefits of the arts and humanities have in our communities and in our lives. During National Arts and Humanities Month, we celebrate the power of the arts and humanities that serve to amplify the voices of our community members. We are home to talented muralists, poets, and entertainers, real homegrown creatives who through their experience have honed their craft and shared with us very personal, even vulnerable versions of themselves. Nationally acclaimed poets, Call San Jose their home. Viet Nguyen, Yosimar Reyes, Luis Valdez, Janice Lobo Sap Sapiago. Did I say that right, Ron? Sapiao. Sapiao, thank you. Let, let me thank the entire arts community for sharing your talent. You bring us together, lift us up, and encapsulate the human experience through an artistic language that resonates with all of us. It's a great honor to present this commendation to Carrie Adams Hepner and folks from the Office of Cultural Affairs for being our amazing liaisons to the arts community. Happy National Arts and Humanities Month, everyone. So I would be remiss if I didn't start with a happy birthday, Councilmember Omar Torres. <laughs> So good afternoon, my name is Carrie Adams Hapner. I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And more and more, I, I view my work as at the nexus between economic development, community development, and cultural development, because the arts have such a range of benefits. But among my favorite benefits, personal favorite benefits, is that the arts and humanities bring us together and they promote empathy and a tolerance for ambiguity, and they lift us up. They teach us what it means to be human today. So I wanna recognize um, the great team at the Office of Cultural Affairs. I also wanna recognize our arts community and our humanities community. We have Bill Schro, who is the CEO of History San Jose, down with us today. And it takes a village. I also wanna recognize the artists who are the backbone of our art community. And this Thursday, we're going to be celebrating leadership in the arts at the annual Cornerstone for the Arts event. We will be recognizing the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. 
also the San Jose Museum of Arts Let's Look at Art program, and Connie Martinez, the president and CEO of SV Creates, and that will be at the Hammer Theater Center. So with that, I wanna uh, conclude by thanking the mayor, Councilmember Torres, for your, and the full council, and as well as the city manager and the CMO team for all of your support for the arts and humanities in San Jose. Thank you. Okay, we're on to orders of the day. Uh, the administration has asked to defer item 8.2, actions related to emergency interim housing programs to 1024. I don't know if anyone needs to add any context or if the maker of the motion can just include that. We will also be have an adjournment today, but before we get to today's adjournment, uh, is there anyone else on the council who would like to make any changes to the printed agenda? Councilmember Ortiz? Thank you, Mayor. I would like to defer item 10.1D. Okay, that is the land use consent item 10.1D. Correct. Okay, great. Do, do you want to, uh, I don't know if you want to add any commentary, if you want to just make sure, a motion. Um, I just ask that we also defer 8.2 per the administration's request, if that's oh, amenable. A absolutely. Great. Um, so just some context, several of uh, the school districts within my my district have reached out to me, Alum Rock, uh, Mount Pleasant, um, and from across the uh, city um, in regards to the zoning changes um, that uh, involve school properties. So they'd like to have a discussion with city staff. Okay. Okay. And what was the other so, item you wanted um, to move? If you would move the orders of the day with deferral of item 8.2 and it sound and 10.1D, as I believe your okay. motion. Okay, I would like to move the orders of the day with a deferral for 8.2, um, and was it 10.1D? Thank you. Second. Second. All right. Great. Thank you, Council Member, and Vice Mayor Kame. I saw your hand was up. Thank you. Um, I actually um, wanted to pull item. Uh, 2.9. I have some um, concerns uh, about that. And, and that, that's on the consent calendar, right. correct? We that's will correct. be, you'll be able to pull items off consent when we get to the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you. And I have a couple other, I know there are a couple items that will be pulled from consent when we get there. Anything else on the orders of the day? Great. Okay, so we're going to handle the adjournment separately since we've now got a motion on the floor for deferring items 8.2 and 10.1. D, I'm gonna to turn to Tony for public comment specifically on orders of the day. Okay, so this public comment, um, I have DC Martin, but I wanna remind um, DC that this is specifically on orders of the day, which is deferring um, a couple of items, 10.1 D and what was the other one? An 8.2. An 8.2, so we're only taking comments on those. Okay, so that hand went down, now we have Blair. Again, Blair, just on orders of the day. Yes, correct. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I just wanted to quickly thank you, Cells, for allowing public comment on orders of the day. Uh, you know how I feel about public comment time. Thank you for allowing public comment at this time. Thanks. Back to council. Okay, great. So we're going to vote on the motion, and then we will move to the uh, take the adjourn the meeting adjournment. Um, Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you, Tony. 
Today's meeting will be adjourned in memory of Robert Bob Cadlick, who passed away on September 30th, 2023. A decorated veteran with the Air Force, Robert was involved with numerous veterans organizations in San Jose over the years and played a major contribution in putting on the annual Memorial Day event and the Veterans Day Parade. Councilmember Dewan will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, my deepest condolences go to the families and friends of Robert Joseph Catholic. Today, we have his sister, Ellen DeCharm, and her husband, Ted DeCharm, joining us for his adjournment. As we gather here today to honor the memory of Robert Joseph Catlack, a man of remarkable achievements, an unwavering dedication, yet there's a couple of things I would like to highlight. Robert's life was marked by his diverse accomplishments. He pursued his passion for photography and earned a degree in aeronautics and business management. He probably served his country as an Air Force intelligent officer, contributing to mission in Vietnam, China, and Korea, earning numerous honors. In the civilian sector, Robert worked as a system engineer, making an important contribution to missile system, space programs, and defense efforts. Beyond his professional life, Robert was passionate about preserving history and dedicated his retirement to researching and conserving his family heritage. He was also a committed advocate for veterans' causes, leaving a lasting impact on our community, and was an active member of United Veterans, veterans Council. Ultimately, Robert Joseph Cadillac was a man of service, excellence, and community involvement. Let us honor his memory by carrying forward his value of dedication patriotism, and compassion. His legacy will continue to inspire us, and he will be deeply missed. At this time, I'd like to introduce our former Vice Mayor, Rose Herrera. She also is the President of the United Veteran Council of Santa Clara County. asked me to say a few words. Uh, she wanted me to convey to you how grateful she is for this honor that the city council and mayor have bestowed on Bob today. Um, Ellen is from Wisconsin. Uh, Bob, her brother, came here 40 years ago, so he spent over half his life uh, here in the valley with us, and as you heard, he had an incredible uh, career. Um, I had a few notes here. He was one of our longtime um, veteran leaders. He passed on September 30th. Bob was a former Air Force intelligence officer. He was a captain. He was a former vice president of United Veterans Council of Santa Clara County. He was a past commander of Phil Sheridan Camp Number no. 4, sons of the Union veterans of the Civil War. He was a former vice president of VVA, Vietnam Veterans of America 201, a life member of MOA, and DAV and many other veterans organizations. As you've heard, he worked tirelessly over the years to help produce the Memorial Day events at Oak Hill. He worked on um, the UVC Veterans Day Parade. He was a photographer at so many events, and he was actually a trained photographer. That was his initial, one of his initial careers. 
Bob was often there as a photographer in constant motion, moving swiftly in his power wheelchair. Many of you might remember him if you thought about this guy who was moving around so fast in that power chair, capturing those special moments. He used his considerable talents to assist many veterans organizations, mostly behind the scenes, producing flyers, programs, photographs, and anything that was asked of him. Bob kept going even though he was fighting a losing battle with muscular dystrophy. He never complained. He faced his numerous health challenges with great courage. Bob was a huge contributor to our veterans community and he will be greatly missed by all. I will miss him personally. He was my friend. I want to say that the memorial services for Bob are planned for November 6 at 11 a.m. at Oak Hill Memorial Park in San Jose. And as you've heard, Bob leaves behind his sister Ellen Ducharme her husband, Ted Ducharme, and niece, Jennifer Wallen, and nephew, Thomas Bachel. I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, there's some folks here that came to honor Bob. Cole Cameron, who's the chair of the County Veterans Commission, is here, and, and as well, Rich McCoy, who's part of United Veterans Council and Disabled American Veterans. We thank you for coming here today. Thank you very much for giving us the time to honor Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, and Councilmember Dewan, and our condolences and gratitude to Bob's family. We are moving on to the closed session report. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Okay. Thank you, Nora. Um, so we're on to the consent calendar, and as I understand it, uh, Councilmember Torres would like to pull item 2.9 and Councilmember Batra would like to pull item 2.12, both of those just for comment. So the motion can include all of the items, as I understand it. Are there any other items that the council would like to pull? Okay, I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Torres first for comment and feel free to make a motion if you'd like. I'll, I'll yield my time to uh, Vice Mayor Kamei since she has concerns. I just had talking points and um, Okay, so we'll hear from the Vice Mayor first. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, when there's a conversion from a potential TOT to uh, zero and not even property tax, I am a little bit concerned. I know that this is uh, something that, um, you know, we are only um, acknowledging a separation of the two properties. <coughs> but I think that there are greater impacts down the line. And, you know, in terms of, we all know that housing is necessary. Um, there are perhaps other opportunities to uh, create housing, student housing, including perhaps uh, looking at other uh, properties uh, that can have better utilization, uh, like the garage on uh, 2nd and 3rd Street. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit um, hesitant to agree on this, simply because I think that it is really unfortunate, and I understand that you know things are slowly coming back uh, to downtown, not fast enough to be able to fill all the rooms. But once you close that off, you know we're not going to receive the amount of TOT coming back, right? Because you're changing its its uh, its use. So I just, I just want to express that tremendous concern, and I am not, I mean, I could be convinced otherwise, but um, I am not convinced that this is the, in the best interest of the city of San Jose. It's a fair comment, and Councilor Torres, before I turn to you, if I may, I'll just offer a couple of quick reflections just off the cuff here. I, I think, uh, Vice Mayor, you make a very, a very reasonable point about the importance of TOT tax and having that hotel room capacity for attracting larger events. I also think we have to be 
responsive to market conditions and be able to be flexible and have an evolution over time. What we're seeing is, a, is that South Tower largely sitting empty, generating no TOT, and being a significant financial drag, as I understand it, on the owner of the hotel. We want to make sure that the hotel is right-sized and able to continue in operation and not put at financial risk of potentially going under if we don't enable flexibility in response to market conditions. I also think that we have a really unique opportunity here to have 800 students from San Jose State moving out into the rest of the downtown, living near Cesar Chavez Plaza, creating that vibrancy and foot traffic back and forth from the Cesar Chavez Plaza area to the campus area. And that vibrancy and added foot traffic and customer base for retail will actually help attract additional investment in the downtown, which could go to future hotel construction, future residential. It's a tough trade-off. I personally also wish we were not in the situation where we had to have this kind of reaction to market conditions, but I think a failure to act here would forego a very significant opportunity to provide student housing, increase vibrancy and foot traffic in a key corridor in downtown, and would not actually add to TOT or support the hotel and could actually put the hotel at financial risk. So having assessed this pretty thoroughly, I personally think it is the best of a couple of bad options at the moment. And I hope that in a couple of years, we'll be looking at the expansion and investment in new hotels because we'll have so much demand as our downtown bounces back. Unfortunately, as we all recognize, that's not the, the moment that we're in and hasn't been for, for a few years now. Uh, Councilor Torres, I don't know if you want to add to that. Please. Uh, since, since, since on the same item? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, it seems like Councilmember Torres wants the last word. I think that's what <laughs> no, probably I, I don't. I'm just but, but maybe I'll have some questions after you talk. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, I'm kidding. Uh, you, know, you know, I know San Jose State, uh, I've met with the representative. I know they've done a lot of due diligence, a lot of conversations. Uh, and I was wondering, Charlie, or you or anyone else, if you want to talk about it, because I, I know you've had conversations with Team San Jose, who's essentially the folks managing uh, a lot of what we try to do with, with uh, our facilities downtown and filling, you know, um, getting heads in, in the hotel rooms and such. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, what conversations have been had with uh, Team San Jose and whether they think this is going to be a significant impact on the TOT revenue? Thanks, Sergio. So, councils, this is a really unique opportunity, as the mayor pointed out. We have a struggling hotel. We have, and by the way, I'm the vice president, I'm Charlie Foss, I'm the vice president for uh, administration and finance, the CFO at San Jose State. I'm also the chair of the San Jose Sports Authority. And so I wear a multiple hats here. And as the chair of the Sports Authority, we're looking constantly to bring events into the downtown. And we activate as much as possible. Given all the activation that we do, there's two events that will fill up that Signia Hotel. Two events, it's the World Cup and it's the Super Bowl. Other than that, we're not gonna fill the place up. Filling it up with 800 students on a daily basis and then internships during the summer make a vibrant downtown, make so all these open storefronts that we have get filled. And that way, patron, people feel safer, people feel activated, and our students are going to enjoy having a cheaper, more affordable place to live. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, that answered my question. And I would also say, as part of the conversations I had with one of your team members, I asked about the commitment from San Jose State to try to activate that area, given that there's going to be a good number of students there. Um, and so I forget exactly what she said, but can you touch on that and how you all think that you can help integrate them into the broader downtown community? Very much so. So if you do the, the mile walk, right, or the quarter mile walk, it's actually shorter walk to go from that south tower to our library than it is from our current housing on campus to the library. And so I've said quite often uh, in multiple agendas here, San Jose, downtown San Jose, is San Jose State's campus. It's not one Washington Square. It's not between 4th and 10th. It's the whole downtown. We want to be seamless back and forth. Having our students start at the light rail and walking the campus is interesting, but starting at Chavez Park and walking over, now we've taken up most of the downtown. 
Some people are afraid of students coming into downtown. Students have money, students have activation, they have eyeballs, and it, it provides safety for everyone. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. And, and I would just say, it wasn't clear enough. I'm supportive of the project, I think it's a good idea. I'm gonna be supportive of it, but I'll stop talking and hand it off to Mr. Torto. Thanks, no, Council Actually, now that, now, that, now that Charlie is here, uh, Charlie, can you, before, before uh, you get off the mic, can you, can you just let uh, the folks who are obviously on this dais concerned about some uh, potential job losses. Um, I, was gonna, I was gonna speak about that anyways, but um, the folks who are gonna be working in the, this annex, they're gonna be part of a bargaining unit, correct? Absolutely, uh, so San Jose State is a union environment, union shop. Uh, we have CSU, EU, we have our Teamsters unions. Uh, so any of the custodial work uh, that's going on or the trades work, Frankly, we have 10 or 20 jobs open right now. If anybody's looking for work, um, we, you know, I'll gladly hire people at the university right now in those open positions. Uh, talking to uh, uh, the Signia owner, he does not forecast any job losses uh, at the at the Signia. But I have open jobs. We're a union shop. We would hire people in a heartbeat. Okay, great. Thank you. And oh, Chancellor Torres, yeah, no, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to pro prolong the meeting. Um, you you mentioned it, Mayor. This is uh, you know this is it's unfortunate that we have to that we we have to you know move forward with this this project, but it's it's the best option that we have. And myself, as an elected official for downtown, right, I need to balance you know our our business interests and our and 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 our working class community and our and our. Um, major university, which is San Jose State, and, and so it, for me, uh, I feel really comfortable uh, working with SJSU to make sure that our South Bay Labor Council still has it has a seat at the table when it comes to this, um, but also um, that they are committed in making sure that there are no job losses for Unite 19, and so that's uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I'm I'm supporting this project. Um, and as a former student, I went to San Jose State. I bounced around a bunch of apartments living in San Jose State because I know how hard it was to live in downtown San Jose. And so um, it is very important for us to make sure that we're utilizing this underutilized uh, annex uh, for student housing. And so with 800 new students on the Paseo of San Antonio, it's just gonna be uh, an incredible, uh, just incredible how our businesses are already reacting to it. I've already met with Bijan Bakery and Bijan Bakery is just ecstatic that there'll be 800 new folks there. Uh, we're seeing a, a, a revitalization of Paseo and so 800 new students. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm supportive of the project and I hope my colleagues can be supportive of the project too. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, great, we're gonna go back to Vice Mayor Kamei and I am cognizant that we have another item that's been pulled just so I don't forget that. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Councilmember Torres for that clarification of it remaining union. I think that's important. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, there is a uh, revenue loss, and as we start thinking about next year and how things are, you know, sort of um, unknowable, right, in terms of revenue, how that can impact anything in the future potential. I do recognize mayors. Uh, I do recognize Mayor's point about you know um, you know having a facility that's empty. I love San Jose State. I'm an alumni, so you know I I, I love to work with them. Uh, but I just I just think that it's a big problem. And you know if there are ways of being able to not do that, that would be a preference. But uh, thank you, Mem thank you, Councilmember Torres. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Um, agreed. It's not certainly not ideal. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Sorry not to belabor the issue, but I just wanted to uh, first thank you, Charlie, for clarifying what can happen in, that, in the tower, and it makes perfect sense to repurpose it for 800 students. While we may be sacrificing TOT, there will be tax revenue, in sales tax revenue generated from those young people per and their purchasing power in downtown San Jose. Not to mention the activation of that area, which we're, we're screaming for activation in that area that will bring other people around to benefit the small businesses and the businesses owners there. 
and uh, eyes on the street certainly add to the safety of the community as well. So I am hugely in support of this, if that wasn't clear. Thank you. Great. Thank you, council member. All right, everybody's got comments on this item. Council member Cohen. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't gonna say anything, but I, 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 I'm, supportive, I'm supportive of the project. I think it's a good alternative use. I just wanted to express my concern along with council member Kamei. It's a slightly different form of concern. Um, I do get a little nervous when we make decisions about, big decisions about reuse of property on the short term when, when we hope that in the long term things will be different. And I know that we've been trying, and it's not just about big sporting events, but about trying to draw convention business to the city. And I know, for example, when we had a conversation at the League of Cities last month about where to hold our convention, it, I think it was three or four years from now, San Jose was one of the bidders. There, there was a comment about there not being enough hotel rooms near the convention center to hold that convention. We are sacrificing significant convention business in the future every time we end up losing hotel rooms. So I just want us to be thoughtful about that. Obviously, I think you know we're in this position now, and we ought to move forward with this project. But you know, it, it, to me, it's not even about the TOT. It's about the, perp, the, the what we do need to make a downtown vibrant, and convention business is a key part of downtown vibrancy. And I hate to see us take a step forward and then two steps back when when we make these decisions. So I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think that is a very fair point, and probably the real cost here is, is fewer room blocks. I, I do think as we see demand pick up, we'll hopefully see investment in new hotel capacity. Um, but obviously there's a lag, so there is a cost, there's a risk. Okay, uh, we also had council member Batra pull item 2.12. Council member, do you wanna comment on item 2.12? Yeah, I wanted to pull this for comments. Uh, I don't have any controversies about it. Uh, I just wanted to compliment that the city of San Jose has the foresight in 2018 to pass the biggest Measure T bond measure for purposes of disaster preparedness, public safety, and infrastructure. It also had the foresight with this large bond to create a commu community oversight committee to watch that these dollars were going in the right direction for the projects for which it was done. I'm really glad that both things have proven to be exactly the way it should be, that the bond measure has given us the projects which really have enhanced the capabilities of this city. And the Oversight Committee has given us the confidence that their reports tell us that these projects are really the ones which were supposed to be funded with Measure T and are going on track. One of the projects I just want to highlight, which is about to be completed, is the Emergency Operations Center which started on January 12th, 2021 for $54 million is about to go into the use. And as we know that the Emergency Operations Center after 2016's issues which happened with the city is going to be a key part of us being able to handle any emergencies which arise in the city of San Jose. So I want to compliment all the people who have been involved, the public works and others in planning this thing and for bringing this Measure T bond to success. Thank you very much for the work done and uh, continued success. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member, would you like to move the consent calendar as a whole? Would you like to move the consent calendar as a whole? Uh, yes. I move uh, the consent calendar Thank you. for adoption. Great, thank you. All right, let's go to public comment. Um, we have one hand up, Blair Beekman. Again, this is on consent calendar as a whole. If you're re referring to a specific item, please include the item number. Go ahead, Hi, Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I don't quite know the item, uh, but it is on the Measure T bond issues, or the update report, basically, the annual report, I guess. Uh, yeah, and I also wanted to quickly mention about uh, the, the hotel issue you just talked about, too. Um, for the Measure T issues, um, 
Thank you for the annual report. Uh, I didn't quite understand if uh, there are some new projects for Measure T that they're sponsoring and will be helping with. Uh, I see a lot of the old projects, and, and that's important and good. I just wondered if there was any new updates we should know about. Um, I can write and ask yourself about that in the future. Uh, I, I, I saw the uh, smart street lights. Uh, you, you were in charge of, uh, not smart street lights, but LED lights. That was a, a major accomplishment and effort of, of Measure T funding, and that involved uh, basically smart street lights, surveillance tech, to have a good a reminder to have a good awareness on uh, you know open tech policies, uh, developing privacy rights issues. Uh, that's a good knowledge to have as a Measure T board, I think, and uh, it can help a lot in your decision making. Um, I guess that's about all for myself right now. Um, about the uh, the hotel issue, um, I, I first heard, I thought I heard Vice Mayor Kame uh, mention that uh, there were ideas around a transfer tax that would be affecting all of San Jose. And uh, if, it, if a transfer tax is just involved specifically with this hotel, that could be a difference. Uh, I don't know if those words are needed or not, but I just thought I would mention it if that's a problem or issue to work out. It sounds like an interesting idea what you're working on, uh, a good creative solution, definitely, and uh, good luck in how it can develop. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Thank you. Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you, Tony. All right, we are on to land use consent. We have polled, just for those following along, the uh, council has chosen to defer item 10.1D, but we'll be taking up the rest of the land use consent calendar now. Move approval. Is there a second? Councilmember Candelas, thank you. Okay, let's go to public comment. I do have a public comment on 10.1D. 10.1D, Teresa Wynn. We've, she is not we've deferred English. that item. I know. She's not an English speaker, so uh, I wondered if the um, Vietnamese interpreter could come down and announce that item 10.1D has been deferred. I'm just looking for him. Joy, can you talk to him? Where is he? I need the interpreter to come down. Would the interpreter be able yes. to convey that we've deferred the item to a future council meeting? Yes, so just announce that 10.1D is deferred to another council meeting and we're not taking it up. Oh, so it's not going to be It's not going to be heard. So if you can just announce that so she knows. Oh, are, is this Teresa? Yes. Oh, you yeah, can that's the speaker. Oh. Um, so, so let her know it's been deferred to another date. Okay, and I have no hands online. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Um, great. We'll come back to the council. I don't see any hands. Let's vote. I've got one person. I don't know who hasn't voted, but one person hasn't voted. And everybody's at their seats? Okay, there it goes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Tony. And if the, if the speaker had her hand up, d shared something in writing, you'll be able to circulate that to our office. Yeah, I will. Great. I will get it Thank to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry that we've deferred the item. Um, okay, we are on item 3.1, report of the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a report today. I'm very excited to share that the Housing Department has released a $50 million notice of funding availability, otherwise known as a NOFA, for new affordable multifamily rental housing projects. This work will directly contribute to advancing the City Council's attracting investments in jobs and housing focus area. This investment will help address San Jose's housing shortage and provide critical housing opportunities to our most vulnerable residents. 
The funds will go toward housing construction for extremely low, very low, and low-income individuals and families with approximately 40% of the funding prioritized for extremely low-income housing. Funding for this NOFA comes from the Low and Moderate Income Housing Asset Fund, Affordable Housing Impact Fees, Inclusionary Housing Ordinance in lieu fees, Home Investment Partnership Programs, and our major E-Funds. The NOFA application is now live at bedingo.com slash San Jose, and affordable housing developers have until November 29th, 2023 to apply. I want to give a sincere thank you to our housing department staff for their work in bringing this opportunity to developers and their continued commitment to creating more affordable housing and addressing our homelessness crisis. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Definitely exciting, and San Jose is demonstrating that we can invest for the long term in building the affordable housing we need, as well as advancing more immediate solutions to our crisis, as we'll talk about later in the meeting. Okay, we are on to item 3.3, which is the city manager's annual report, and I know we have a staff presentation. Folks are coming down. Jim, whenever you're ready, feel free to jump in. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Jim Shannon. I'm the Budget Director, I'm joined here by Assistant Director Bonnie Duong, Deputy Budget Director Claudia Chang, and Financial Status Coordinator Selena, U Selena Ubondo. Together, we will provide a brief overview of the City's 22-23 annual report, which complies with the City Charter and is the City Manager's vehicle for summarizing and analyzing the City's budget performance for the preceding fiscal year. The report provides a technical comparison of budget to actual revenues, and expenditures in each budget fund for the last year and as appropriate explanations concerning material differences between those amounts. It also provides the City Council with a comparison of estimated to actual ending fund balances for all the funds, as well as a summary of the 22-23 year end reserves by fund. And based on this analysis of prior year performance, updated information for the current fiscal year and past direction from the City Council, the annual report recommends a number of 23-24 budget adjustments for your consideration. Well, so our, um, uh, the year ended um, about where we thought it, it would. So when we look at revenues and overall expenditures, revenues uh, across all 141 funds, which we, we manage, uh, ended uh, about where we thought they would be. Expenditures um, were uh, uh, end of the year at or slightly below the budget in most of those funds. When we look at the general fund, the general fund had a very small surplus, and most of the other funds ended the year with balances sort of at or above estimated levels. When we look at the general fund in, in particular, after rebudgets and cleanups, our variance was 0.5% of the modified budget for revenues and expenditures, so pretty tight budgeting there. And we do, as I mentioned earlier, we do have recommended actions to close out 22-23, adjust 23-24 where necessary in accordance with City Council Policy 1-818, recognizing a number of grants and reimbursements and address several urgent needs in some special and capital funds. But first, just start with a couple of high-level pictures of some economic data. Here we have em employment within the San Jose MSA and um, some, some good news and mixed news. When you look at the graph there, that is the employment level and year over year we are better than where we were from June of 22 when you look at June of 23. But when you look at that little table to the right for the unemployment rate, um, it's softening up some. So we are at 3.7% at the end of June, whereas the year prior we were at 2.7%. So something that we want to keep an eye on as, as economic conditions soften somewhat. Um, what, what has been continued uh, a low spot is the real estate market. So that's you know, not a surprise to everyone as real estate, as um, interest rates are, are higher, it's, 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 it's harder to have these properties change hands. Looking at the residential side, um, the median single family home price, which is a nice metric for us, has remained pretty, pretty solid. So we got $1.6 million is our median uh, home, home price. But looking, uh, 
from, from June to June. But when you compare the average sales per month across both fiscal years, we're down about 30, 33%. And so um, that has Im, Im, impacts for all those transactions, all those taxes that are related to real estate transactions. So think of the real property transfer tax for measure E, the construction and, and, and conveyance tax, those are lower. And um, we may be taking uh, major budget adjustments later on in the year to maybe bring those down further potentially. But we'll have more on that later. Uh, just looking at a few of the major general fund revenues, um, this is not everything in the general fund. We have lots and lots of stuff going on in the general fund, but these are some of the bigger items. A couple interesting pieces here. So on the property tax uh, line, that's our biggest revenue uh, category in the general fund. Um, definitely has some con uh, continued and solid growth. But what's interesting about property tax as a reminder is that 22-23 property tax revenue is based on the valuation for calendar year 2021, right? So we're a little bit lagged when it comes to property tax revenues. And so we expect can, uh, growth to still occur, but because you saw the slide prior, we expect that, that growth to be slower than what it was in, in years past. Sales tax is also pretty interesting. So again, we had some pretty good growth there. We started the year hot for sales tax. So our first and second quarter, our year over year growth compared to the prior quarter was 11% growth and 15% growth re respectively. So that was super hot. But then when we got into the third, the, the third quarter, the year-over-year -year growth went all the way down to, I think, just under 4%. And so that was a pretty big drop. And so, um, uh, and so we had to sort of pr uh, protect ourselves somewhat as we headed into the year-end process um, to, to ma make sure that we could weather a potential further, further drop. When you think about just a 4% 4, 4 growth, when you factor in inflation into that, which was higher at the time, that's actually a negative economic growth. And so there was a potential that uh, we, we protected ourselves in, uh, to estimate a potential 5% drop for the fourth quarter. It wasn't that, 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 that bad. It stayed at around the 3.5 to 4% 4, to 4 range. So um, it ended softer the year, which we, which we had anticipated kind of, we had always thought sales tax would be slowing up, and it certainly did. It just sort of slowed up a little faster than we had initially planned. Uh, on the utility tax side, um, you know, when you pay your bill for your, your gas tax, your electricity, your cable, your telephone, there's a, there's a tax that flows to the city's general fund on those bills. So in particular, as the cost of energy has really risen for electricity and gas in, in particular, those revenue categories have also grown pretty strongly, which is a pretty unusual growth to see that 20% 20, 20 growth there. So that's been some, uh, somewhat of a stabilizing factor. As the economic, uh, economically sensitive revenue category softened, the, the utility tax has remained pretty, pretty solid. You see the Measure E real property transfer tax again, so that's one that's really impacted by the transactions that dropped 50% year over year. Now, the $110 million in 21-22 is, I mean, that's an anomaly in, in and of itself, too. We had a lot of high-dollar commercial transactions in 21-22 that drove a lot of that. We never expect to see levels that are that, are that high, but we did expect that number to come down to 22-23. We had a budget of 65 million. It came in there at 56.3, so, and we do have some corresponding technical adjustments on the expense side in 23-24 to sort of take, take down those Measure E um, uh, 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 appropriations proportionally to their, their, um, their city council policy buckets. And I want to mention too here is interesting, the use of money and property. So as interest rates rise, the amount of returns that the city can get on its cash balances in its fund through short-term investments managed by the finance department does go up. And so you see that pretty, pretty big rise in um, interest earnings from the use of money and property there. So that's that's uh, a little bit of a bright spot. And the TOT, which was referenced a little bit earlier, um, very strong growth, 42% growth year over year for transient occupancy taxes. But, you know, we're still pretty far away from the roughly $20 million or so we had in the pre-pandemic pre times. Oops, too much. Go back. Please, please go back. There we go. Um, so for our general fund, ver uh, looking at the additional fund fund balance, so we had a gross fund balance of 639.4 million, which is 9.7 million above the estimate used for the um, adopted budget, which is 0.3% of our modified budget for revenues and expenditures. Um, when we think about the things for all the technical adjustments that we'll get into in a little bit, um, our actual available ending fund balance is 18.6 million, which is 0.5% of the modified budget for revenues and expenditures. Um, that fund balance was generated by some of those stronger revenue categories that we talked through earlier, as well as some expenditure savings within the citywide expense category, which is a little bit unusual for us. 
So when I was putting together my notes for today's presentation, I, I thought maybe this slide may not have been my best choice. But um, I think it's really important for us to, to think about um, not only sort of budget to actuals, but um, estimate to actuals, because that's what really drives our budgeting process. Um, and so just kind of kind of walk us through here, take a couple minutes. Um, we start with our, our budget of 22-23 of all in, 2.3 billion on the source side. So that source rows is everything, property tax, sales tax, utility tax, that's all squenched into one, to one line there. Then we've got 2.3 billion in uses, which are separated into those other categories, departmental expenditures, which includes personal services and non-personal, non, non citywide capital transfers and reserves. So we had a budget of 2.3 billion on the expense side, but we didn't think we were gonna spend all of that money. So as we put together the adopted budget, we had assumption we would spend about one, 1.7 billion of that. But um, it turned out, so, so we thought we would have an ending fund balance of about 629.6 million. Most of which of that uh, becomes a funding, well, all of that becomes a funding source for 23, 20, 24. Most of that then uh, funds projects that are re-budgeted re, re for projects and programs that are already in, in process to continue some reserves that, that need to be funded still. So um, it, it's, uh, that's what most of that funding is used for. But you can see there, what we actually had was a fund balance of 639.4 million, or $9.7 million higher than what our estimate was. And sort of that's our starting point for the annual re report process. Um, and you can see there means we had $6 million less of revenue than we thought we would get in, and we had $15.7 million of expenditure savings lower than what we thought we would have. So when you kind of uh, put those together, you have $9.7 $9 million of, of, of fund fund balance. But then we keep on moving to, to the right on, on this column, and we got the adopted budget net zero adjustments, which we do as part of the year, and this is uh, taking uh, into account uh, grant-related revenue and expenditure actions, which are re-budgeted re into the following fiscal year. And then we got that second to last column, which is our annual report re-budget and cleanup. So these are all of the final technical actions that we have to, again, to re-budget re funding for projects already in, in, uh, in progress, recognize additional uh, grant revenue or Re-budget revenue we thought was gonna be received in 22, 23, but it's not, it's gonna be received this fiscal year. Um, and uh, do those technical reallocations like the Measure E reallocation, which is buried in a couple of the appropriations there. So that gives us $8.9 million of fund balance, which gets us to that $18.6 million um, that Bonnie's gonna talk about in a second. Just two more things on this. Um, so the final source variance of 12.4 million, a lot of that is, we had a couple of odd things going on for, for this annual report, and so, one of them was we had um, a uh, Californians for All grant, which helps us continue some of those um, resilience core work spread amongst PRNS and library and OE OEDCA. We had the expenditures for that, but we didn't collect about $11 million worth of revenue in 22, 23. So that's gonna come in this year. So we're still gonna get the money, it's just gonna be delayed a little bit. So we have to account for that revenue 23, 20, 24. And then it's really odd to have $13 million of expenditure savings on the citywide side. Normally that's a million and a half, $3 million of savings. But we had a couple things going on. One, we just had a lot of closeouts of some projects that have been around for a while, some programs that are just finally spending the last of their, of their funding, grants that are no longer going, going to come in. So we just had a sort of a bunch of just savings from a lot of small different pots that are just getting closed out. And we also had a couple of items, again, too, where uh, we thought the expenditures were going to happen in 23, 20, 24, so we had re-budgeted re some one-time funding um, from 22, 23 into 23, 24. But in fact, those expenditures were spent last year, and so we need to take the budget away from the current year budget because last year's budget had already spent it. So a little bit unusual and a little bit higher dollars, but um, one of those was, I think, about $7 million for some of the interim housing stuff, maybe another $2 million for Beautify San Jose. So when you think about that revenue re-budget re of $11 million, and a couple of those higher dollar uh, negative re-budgets re, re of around $10 million, that accounts for a lot of the fund balance that you see on that table. Sort of a little uh, odd sort of one-time actions here. So I apologize for belaboring that, but um, that's how we think of it in the budget office, and you get a little, a little taste into the madness. Uh, and so now I'm gonna transfer over to Bonnie. Thanks, Jim. The general fund ended the year with additional fund balance of $9.7 million. Um, but when you're adjusting for net rebudgets and cleanup actions, the revised total ending fund balance increases by another $8.9 million, giving a total of $18.6 million. The entire uh, revised fund balance is recommended to be allocated for required technical rebalancing actions. These are budget actions that align already approved revenue estimates and expenditure adjustments with the most current tracking information. 
reallocate funding for ongoing appropriations based on updated needs, correct technical um, issues from the 23-24 adopted budget, or comply with actions previously approved by the City Council. Next, we have net zero adjustments for activities supported by grants, reimbursements, and fees. That totals $3 million in both revenues and expenses. There are no recommended allocations toward, toward urgent fiscal program needs or other distributions in accordance with City Council Policy 1-18, which would typically be made to supplement reserves, such as the Budget Stabilization Reserve. Recommended adjustments for required technical rebalancing actions totals approximately $18.6 million. On this slide here is the list of the largest adjustments that's included in the annual report. The first item here is increasing the emergency interim housing construction and operation appropriation by $15 million. So uh, that brings it from $14.5 million to $29.5 million. This supplements the current year, um, current year and future year resources for the development, design, construction, and operation of interim housing sites. As part of the approval of the mayor's June budget message for 23-24 and the 23-24 adopted operating budget, the city council directed the allocation of up to $15 million from the general fund ending fund balance over two years for interim shelter and other homeless support program costs if additional funding was available. So given that the availability of ending fund balance um, and the continued prioritization of the city council and community to address unsheltered homelessness, uh, that the city continues to move forward with interim housing development um, at Rue Ferrari, Cerrone, Cherry, um, and as well as a cost benefit analysis of Via Del Oro, which is scheduled for city council consideration. Um, Via Del Oro is going today and then the others are getting deferred to the 24th. Um, and the significant resource needs for these critical programs, the full $15 million is allocated to support the near-term development and operating costs of interim housing. Next, we had set aside $1.35 million in the Community and Economic Recovery Reserve to capture savings from prior year response and recovery work streams or initiatives um, and to provide sufficient funding for the city's potential financial commitment toward the isolation and quarantine program that's managed by the County of Santa Clara. Also, we have set aside $1 million in the contingency reserve, which increases it to $50 million. This also includes a cleanup action of $2 million, which is a reconciling item, um, in accordance with City Council Policy 1-18, which provides for the maintenance of a minimum 3% contingency reserve in the general fund to meet unexpected circumstances arising from financial or public emergencies that require immediate funding that cannot be met by any other means. Also set aside is $680,000 in our Solid Waste Code Enforcement Program Reserve, um, which is a combination of expenditure savings and additional revenues in 22-23. Um, this will support the full cost recovery of the program for the future years. Also set aside $510,000 in the City Attorney's Office Outside Litigation Reserve to restore funding to needed levels following the reallocation of resources to the City Attorney's Office in 22-23 for outside legal services. We've also set aside $400,000 to the un Unanticipated Emergency Maintenance Appropriation to fund an assessment of all the elevators in the Civic Center in initial funding for as needed repairs and maintenance of the elevators. Due to the age, aging elevator system infrastructure at the Civic Center and recent reliability issues, there's a need to update and modernize control panels and infrastructure for the elevators within the facility. Also set aside is $375,000 to the Public Works Department in their non-personal equipment appropriation to provide resources necessary to address urgent maintenance needs at various city-owned properties. This includes the demolition of a property, property at, on Taylor Street for security and cost-effective reasons, as well as replacing an HVAC system and fire control panel and building management system at additional pri properties prior to new tenants moving in. Then there was a, there's a transfer of $2.2 million from the American Rescue Plan Fund to the General Fund, which reflects the remaining balance in the ARP Fund due to accumulated interest earnings and liquidated encumbrances. Um, this will support work streams previously funded by the ARP Fund that got shifted into the General Fund in 2223. It should also be noted that this contribution will serve, um, or this amount will serve as a contribution to the $15 million that's allocated for the emergency interim housing and housing construction and operation appropriation as well. And I will now turn it over to Claudia. 
Good afternoon. The graph above shows the collection history of these three construction-related taxes. The key takeaway is that these taxes are declining and we need to keep an eye on them. The building and structure construction tax, which is the blue bar, and the construction excise tax, which is a yellow bar, these are major sources of funding for the traffic capital program. They track closely to the building project valuation activity. For the past three years, valuations have dropped each year since the historically high levels in 1920. At $16.4 million, the building and structure construction tax receipts in 22-23 were below the budgeted estimate of 19 million and lower than the 21-22 collections of $21.2 million. For 23-24, we have a budget of $19 million for these taxes. Construction excise tax receipts for 22-23 totaled $10.9 million, which was below the budgeted estimate of $14 million and below the 21-22 collections of $16.2 million. For 23-24, for we have $15 million budgeted in this category. Construction and conveyance tax revenues, the gray bars, are a significant source of funds for the parks and community facilities development, library, fire, service yards, and communications capital programs. CNC tax receipts for 22-23 totaled $37.9 million. The actual tax receipts in 22-23 were below the budgeted estimates of $40 million and significantly below the historically high tax receipts in 21-22 of $64.5 million, primarily due to a tightened local real estate market, which is the primary driver of this revenue source. For 23-24, $40 million is budgeted in this category, which would require a 5.7% growth from the 22-23 collection level. Through June of 2023, there were a total of 5,716 property transfers for all re residences, which represents a decline of approximately 33% from the prior year levels. The good news, though, is that the medium, medium single-family home price grew. As of June, the single-family home price totaled $1.6 million, which represents a 2.4% increase from the June 2022 median price. The next chart shows us um, information about passenger activity levels at the airport. The key takeaway is that the airport performance has been strong and sustaining for the past couple of years. The airport served 12.1 million passengers in 22-23, an increase of 24% from passenger levels in 21-22 of 9.8 million, and a significant increase compared to 4.2 million passengers in 2021. Passenger traffic continues to show signs of rebounding from the low in 2021, and airport pro projects continue and airport projects growth with an estimated 13.2 million passengers in 23-24. Operating revenues were also higher than expected and exceeded budgeted levels uh, by $18.1 million, and operating expenditures ended the year slightly below budget. Great, and just um, a, couple, a couple more notes here. So one of our major in enterprise funds, the San Jose Clean Energy Fund, just wanna show the improving condition of this fund and, and this program. Uh, so we had, as council knows, a recent shift to a new cost of service model for the rates and also a lower power uh, charge indifference adjustment, PCIA, um, uh, beginning uh, last, uh, this calendar year that have really improved the budgetary position. We're still working toward 180 day operating reserve. We're not quite there yet. Um, but as you can see from that table below, we are getting close. We have $174 million ending the fiscal year and hoping to end at around 219 for the current budget year that, that, that we are in. And then, of course, the, the budget, the, I'm sorry, the annual re report has a number of other adjustments throughout a number of special and capital funds. We're just highlighting a few of them here. Also more adjustments in the, in the general funds. Um, a couple maybe more to, to highlight in the capital funds. We are moving some funding around to be able to take advantage of some uh, additional resources for school, school safety program. We also had budget adjustments in there to pre-position ourselves for the NOFA that was recently released. And so uh, with that, uh, we are going to close. And I want to thank, again, my team up, up, up here, as well as Bryce and William, our, 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 our key help on the operating side, as well as the budget office staff. So this document comes together in less than four weeks. Um, and it's actually the hardest document that we do all year long. And so I really want to thank my, my staff and then all the departments that are so key to 
both uh, developing the budget, monitoring the budget, and then helping us close it out. So thank you so much to the colleagues here. With that, we are ready for questions. Great. Thank you, Jim, Bonnie, the whole team. Really appreciate that thorough presentation. Really important context for all of us um, just to understand where we are today and as we head into the next budget cycle in the new year. Uh, why don't we go to public comment, Tony? I have no hands. Okay. Coming back to the council then. Turning to my colleagues for questions or a motion. I'll move approval. Second. Okay. And Vice Mayor, did you have a question? Uh, just a quick, quick comment. Sure. First of all, I want to say thank you for all your good work and your ability to be available whenever questions arise. So thank you so much for uh, for doing that. Um, one of the things that you know, having gone through the process. Uh, not too long ago, uh, that came up was the whole thing about the year-end balance. And, you know, I don't know when in the next process is going to be appropriate to um, talk about priorities as opposed to leaving it to the end and then attaching things to the end. Um, so it's something that I think that if we're able to find a way to um, figure that out, I don't know at what point, but I, I would urge us not to wait till the and when you know everyone's talking about oh well it's there's year end dollars here and there you know i just i just think that that priorities should be expressed in a different way good jim yeah i'm just going to say one one thing i know we uh, the budget calendar is actually going to the rules committee for approval tomorrow and one of those um uh, dates in there is a study session with the city council toward the end of January to talk about the fees and charges study session as well as some of the preliminary things we're seeing for the 2024 budget. So those are really good topics for us to cover there. Perfect. I'll also just add, I think it's a, I think the March budget message is a great opportunity for us next year to take into consideration projected ending fund balance and the city's needs. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? It's our yeah. long-time budget director. Yes, um, yes that's the, when we put out our, our, our forecast, our five-year forecast at the end of February, we will take into account what portion of fund balance we believe will be ongoing. This is one time because, again, the different sources that make up this fund balance can change and change every single year, so we consider this one time. But we do have a fairly good amount of ongoing fund balance that we predict every year and use it as an ongoing funding source. And we do look to, per the charter, to the March budget message and council review and approval of that message as our uh, budget direction of what we bring forward in our my proposed budget on May 1. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And let's hope that next year we're all talking about what to do with our projected ending fund balance. Okay, Councilor Batra. Jim and the team, um, it is very impressive how your forecast and your actual numbers are so close. So compliments for that, but I hope that next year you are not as accurate because you have a projection of a deficit. So I hope you are wrong somewhere in terms of the revenue and we don't really realize that deficit. Thank you very much for the excellent job. So I hope our prayers prove in the other way. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Council Member. Tony, I think we're ready to vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you all. All right, we're on to item 3.5, Housing Department's Performance Measures Audit Report. We have a brief verbal report. I see our city auditor, Joe Royce, coming down. A couple of other city colleagues. Joe, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Joe Roy, City Auditor. Um, I'm here in the box with Rachel Vanderveen from the Housing Department, Eric Jensen from the City Manager's Office, and Rosalind 
Huey, also from the city manager's office. We're here to present uh, the audit housing performance measures. The city should focus and align measures to support decision making. In recent years, the city of San Jose has prioritized preventing homelessness and creating affordable housing. The city's housing department pays, plays a major role in achieving the city's long-term goals in these areas. Other housing services include rent stabilization and tenant protection programs, portfolio management of affordable housing loans, neighborhood capital investment, and others. Housing department reports progress and activities of its programs in different ways, such as performance measures, including the city's adopted operating budgets, housing's annual impact report, online dashboards, and others. The objective of this audit was to assess housing performance metrics. And though this audit was focused on housing services and performance metrics, we do know that other departments may serve the unhoused community, have programs uh, impacted by homelessness, or are involved in the city's affordable housing production efforts. We did not include those departments in this review. The work is intended to assist the administration to enhance the city's performance management systems in alignment with its outcomes, equity indicators, and performance management initiative. We had just one finding, and that's the housing department can streamline and improve current performance measures. So the housing department reports more than 200 performance measures in different forms across various reports and online dashboards. Many of the reported measures are important and useful for users of the information. Others are required because of funding sources. However, we did find that the city's operating budget can provide more useful and meaningful measures that better reflect department priorities, better alignment of performance measures across the various reports and dashboards would help users of the information better understand results, as well as save staff time compiling the information. Lastly, housing can also better document consistent methodologies for calculating measures and provide meaningful targets to put context around the results. We had three recommendations. The city manager's office and housing department should reduce and streamline the number of performance measures for housing programs, align measures across housing's different reporting platforms, and document the methodology for calculating measures to ensure consistency, and lastly, report meaningful targets to provide context for results. I'd like to thank the Housing Department, the Budget Office, and the City Manager's Office for their time and insight during the audit process. The administration has reviewed the information in the report, as shown in the yellow pages of the printed uh, uh, report. Uh, I ask that you accept the report. I'm happy to answer any questions, but first I'll turn it over to Rachel for the administration's response. Thank you, Joe. My name is Rachel Vanderveen. I'm the assistant director with the housing department. And on behalf of the housing department, I want to thank Joe and his team for this audit. The administration confirm, concurs with the three recommendations that were made in this report. The housing department will develop a process to align performance metrics across the department. And this will allow us to better understand and communicate outcomes to our community. These recommendations are consistent with the work that we are currently um, underway with as part of the Community and Economic Development City Service Area team. We are working on updating our mission and performance measures as a part of the City Manager's Outcomes, Equity, Indicators, and Performance Management Initiative. And I want to thank Eric Jensen and his team for leading this effort and helping us walk through that process together. So with that, we are available with, uh, for any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Joe, and everyone in your, on your team who worked on the audit. I think it's a helpful jumping off point for discussing how we, how we better focus and align those uh, metrics. Tony, why don't we go to public comment first? In person, I have Emily. Well, there's, there's people online, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Is it, oh, it's on, okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, council, uh, council members, mayor, vice mayor. Um, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I am with Silicon Valley at Home, or SV at Home. We do want to express some concern, considerable concern, with limited priorities outlined in the memo from the mayor, vice mayor, and council member Foley, and uh, draw specific attention to the need for renter protections and the programs that address housing instability in San Jose. Staff presented an important study session to the body explaining the connection between its three P's programming, production, preservation, protection, um, and the effective response to the housing crisis we face. 
Over 150,000 people in San Jose live in households that pay over half of their income on housing and are just one emergency away from losing their homes. This could be an unexpected rent increase, a large increase, an illness, a car repair, and especially when your budget has no room to absorb the challenges, you are incredibly vulnerable. So uh, rent stabilization and tenant education about available rights and resources are essential tools that our housing department should take on. Um, roughly one, one out of four households who are displaced become functionally homeless, living in their cars, on the street, and in places not fit for habitability, or, or doubling or tripling up in unstable and severely overcrowded situations. So we ask as you continue on with uh, uh, accepting the audit and the priorities that, that you want to uh, focus down on. Oh, please remember tenant protections and those who are very vulnerable to these high rents in our community. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, going on Zoom, I have Oscar followed by events. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Waskar Castro, Working Partnerships USA. Uh, we appreciate the intent of this item, uh, ensuring that our housing department is working in a way that maximizes the department's ability to to do its extremely important work. Uh, as you continue to move forward with this work, it is of utmost importance that all priorities continue to move forward. Uh, in particular, as previously mentioned, we really want to make sure that um, performance measures related to rent stabilization and tenant protections continue to be um, amplified and uplifted. Uh, we have tens of thousands of renters throughout the area. We have um, many thousands of folks that are cost burdened and there's a continued need to ensure that we were doing everything impossible to, to everything possible to keep families housed and to stabilize our communities. Um, we believe that as written, the memo put forth by the mayor and others does not uh, reflect those priorities and we'd like to make sure that there is uh, specific and intentional language to ensure that we are prioritizing all housing priorities and specifically those towards supporting working families and keeping families housed um, going forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide comment. Events at SVH. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and staff. Matthew Reed, Director of Policy at Silicon Valley at Home. Uh, we appreciate the audit's recommendations on rep improving reporting process and clarifying outcome metrics. We particularly appreciate the recommendation that these dashboards and logic models for success include contextual information that grounds our understanding of the work that's being done. For example, we know that as we provide shelter and permanent housing for residents living unhoused in San Jose, more of our neighbors have been losing their homes every year. Contextualizing success within the context of displacement, housing instability, and the overall lack of homes people can afford is essential to understand the city's success in responding to the needs of the unhoused. This is why we have significant concerns uh, that on this item focused on reporting transparency, there is a council mem memo asking for a general reassessment of the mission of the department. Unfortunately, this recommendation appears to avoid the detailed discussions this council had during both the budget discussion and the detailed study session on the housing department's programs. If there was one takeaway, it was how interconnected our programmatic response to the housing crisis are and need to be. There are two truths that we must remember as we consider an overhaul of the housing department. Number one, homelessness crisis that our communities are experiencing is a symptom of an overwhelming shortage of homes that people can't afford. Success of interim housing is dependent on the availability of subsidized housing. In fact, it's in the state law that you must provide a clear pathway to housing for the participants who live in the interim housing if you want to build it. The second truth is that there is no research, no evidence that market rate housing development will have a short term or medium term impact on the affordability crisis faced by the city's very low and extremely low income renters. Back to council. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify, I think there's some confusion about the memo. The intent of the memo is just to make sure that we come back to CED uh, that we direct staff to come back to CD to give us an update on how staff is recommending that we consolidate 
and uh, align our metrics. I don't think there's anything in the memo that is intended to suggest any move away from the three Ps. It actually does reference protecting tenants and talk about making equitable community investments, which would include uh, preservation. Uh, there's no, the, the memo is intentionally very high level in the background because we're intentionally not trying to be prescriptive or say that we think there should be some significant realignment of efforts within the housing department. I think it's simply, if you just look at the recommendation, the, the, the main point is to accept the audit and ask that staff return to CED with an update on how staff is recommending those metrics be narrowed, really for the education and, and context of the council. But there's, um, I, I, don't think, I think I probably speak for my uh, co-authors on the memo when we say that there's no move away from our current strategy here. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to council member Foley. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation, both uh, from the audit, Joe, and from the housing side of things. Thank you, Rachel, for being here. Uh, I, too, don't see uh, item 2.6 as an alarming change from our current focus. To me, it simply says we're going to take a look at what we do, and it may mean that we come back, that staff comes back and says we want to do more in certain areas. But Rachel, can I ask you, how do you interpret 2C? Do you see that as being prescriptive to, or actually I should ask Jennifer, because it directs the city manager to come back. Do you see that as prescriptive to eliminating programs, to highlighting programs, to do anything other than investigating and coming back with suggestions and recommendations? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I absolutely do not. Uh, see that as overly prescriptive. In fact, those areas, the mission, the core service programs, performance management activity, workload highlights are the exact sections in our budget book that I, I intend to review anyway as, I, as we, uh, that we do in, in any department. Um, so that's the core areas we look at and I feel it, it gives us freedom to, again, to propose possible updates as needed. And we'll bring those back through, through the budget process. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the clarification because I, I hope that our community accepts that that's the intent of that item, which is to just take a look at things. There's 200, over 200 performance measures that housing department is supposed to adhere to right now, which is really too many. So all of the, this analysis of the programs we offer, it may be a way to be more efficient in offering the programs we have and more effective in offering the programs that we have. So I see this as a, an efficiency thing and not as an opportunity to eliminate programs, although it may be that we have some outdated program that has been on the books for 50 years that we haven't taken off the books yet. So that would make things a little bit more efficient. Um, with that, I'm going to move the staff recommendation and our memo co-authored by the mayor and the vice mayor and myself. Second. It, the, thank you. The other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, this really will come back to CED to take a look at the two audit recommendations, one in March of 2024 and the second quarter of 2024. So we will be at CED, we will, assuming I'm still in CED next year, uh, that it will still, we will take a look at it and make sure that we're watching for the three Ps and that we're making sure that we, we're, putting, we're putting emphasis on those. With that, I'm concluded, thank you. Thanks, Councilor Foley, appreciate that. Uh, Councilor Ortiz? Thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you to the, my colleagues who authored uh, the memo. I appreciate uh, Council Member Foley elaborating based on the community um, concerns. I also wanna thank individuals uh, from the public who called in um, or who are here in, in person. Um, I can understand you know, the, the amount of pressure tenants and renters are experiencing in this city when housing policies or housing strategies uh, have the opportunity of being deliberate, re-deliberated uh, on this council, it can cause um, some sort of existential, uh, um, you know, alarm or, or worry. Um, I just, I just want to let the public know, um, I, I'm well aware that 
close to 50% of our population are renters. You know, I am a renter, you know, even though historically there hasn't been renters here on the city council, but um, I take my job very seriously to, to work with you. And um, I, I believe that my, my colleagues didn't have any intent in, in doing this, but I, I hear what you're saying and I'll be sure to uh, be active in the conversation. Thank you. Great, thanks Councilman Ortiz. Councilman Cohen. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for the audit report and for the, the response from the Housing Department, and thank you for people who spoke up. I, I just briefly also want to say something kind of similar. I, I appreciate the Mayor's comments about continuing to focus on the three Ps, and I just, I just know there was a sensitivity to potential changes in the overall mission of the Housing Department. While there's no doubt in my mind that um, there can always be a reevaluation of the performance measures and metrics we use to understand if we're successful. and. I, I know as well as anybody that these large list of metrics makes it really hard for us to tell if we're making and moving the needle and being successful. I think the, the reaction that some people had to this memo was sort of that first statement of saying update the department's mission, and I'm not sure that we're necessarily supportive here of updating the mission of the housing department. I think protecting tenants, preserving properties, building housing, those are, those are the key mission, and I don't necessarily think we want to review the mission, but I do believe there are elements of how we do that, what, what our exact initiatives are, and what our measures are that could use that evaluation. So I just, just wanted to express that, let's be a little, I just want to be a little careful about the wording here, because that's what I think caused a reaction, is, the, is that feeling that maybe we're talking about revisiting the overall mission of the department. But so I, I'll support the motion as it is. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Um, I wanted to reiterate that the three P's are critically important. I think a lot of work has been done. And so the memo is not to diminish uh, the three P's. Um, and I think that uh, the, the idea is really to have information come back to CED. So I want to thank you for the report. I want to thank uh, the staff, the housing department staff for their response and in the hopes of moving things together and making things better in the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Okay, let's vote. Motion passed unanimously. Great. Thank you. Thanks to city staff for the audit and department response. Looking forward to hearing updates from staff and CD next year. Let's go on to our next item, which is item 4.1, community outreach regarding street closures and traffic diversions for large crowd events. We have members of our police department heading down to the box. Including Chief Mata, good afternoon, Chief. Chief, is there a staff presentation on this item? A very short one. All right. Well, welcome, and whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, Mayor, City Manager, and Council. Uh, Tony Mata here, Chief of Police, here along with um, Lieutenant Paul Hamblin and um, Lieutenant Nikwai Sherry of the Traffic Enforcement Unit here to present a verbal a report on our um, community out outreach plan regarding street closures and traffic uh, diversions for large crowd events. Uh, and before we get into the verbal presentation, I just um, want to say a few words that currently our plan for large uh, crowd events uh, utilizes uh, street closures and traffic diversions as a proactive measure that has been proven to reduce both traffic congestion and to improve public safety. Um, and this memo will provide a work plan or provides a work plan and timeline for collaborative outreach. And that outreach will include uh, outreach to our community stakeholders, neighborhood associations, business associations, our council offices, and the media, specifically um, providing um, information in different languages, both Spanish uh, and Vietnamese. Uh, and with that, um, I'll I'm turn it over to uh, Lieutenant um, Paul Hamblin, who will touch on some items that we considered for this, uh, for this memo. Thank you, Chief. Historically, the Cinco de, de Mayo weekend, which is usually the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday closest to May 5th on the calendar each year, 
has drawn heavy pedestrian and vehicular traffic in the downtown and foothill corridors. Each year in the months leading up to Cinco de Mayo, the department has prepared a plan to enable residents and visitors to enjoy this event and also mitigate some of the vehicular impact. Each year the plan contains a contingency plan to implement a series of street closures and traffic diversions if traffic becomes overly congested. Next year, in the months leading up to Cinco de Mayo in 2024, the department will work with the city council offices of the districts most likely to be affected to engage in community outreach regarding any contingency plans for street closures or traffic diversions. To achieve this goal, the department has developed a work plan which can be implemented for any large crowd event of a similar scale. Before the operational plan for the event is finalized, city council offices and designated department members will identify crucial stakeholders in the community and set up meetings during which department members will answer questions and receive input from the stakeholders, which will inform the operational plan. The department will also share any contingency plans for street closures based on traffic congestions that might occur as well as the hours and days that these plans are most likely to be put into effect. The department has designated Lieutenant Nkwai Sherry, who's with us here on the Diaz, of the department's traffic enforcement unit to be its point of contact for public outreach. Once the operational plan is finalized, Lieutenant Sherry will follow up with stakeholders and answer any outstanding questions. As the event gets closer and once it has begun, the department, through its media relations unit, will communicate its plan to the community through press releases and social media. When street closures are actually implemented, notice of where the closures are occurring and how they, long they will be in effect will be communicated through social media. Throughout the entire process, department staff will monitor success of this plan and communicate any issues to the city council through PISFIS after the event and prior to the end of the 2024 calendar year. Thank you, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Before we turn to council discussion, let's go to public comment. No hands raised at this time. Thank you, all right, back to the council. We'll start with council member Candelas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I wanna thank the department, I wanna thank the administration for um, for the update and, and the the, uh, the outreach plan in effect, um, I, I think the willingness to jump in and improve a process, which I know I heard from from my community, is is important. Um, and and anytime we can do a, a process improvement in our city to better communicate with residents, stakeholders, businesses, is 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 an opportunity for for us to do our, our job as a city. And and you know, much like the the highway closures that are happening on the 20th and 21st on Highway 87. Um, our, our community needs to know that that's going to be happening to better prepare for that. So, you know, in terms of large crowded crowd events, this should be the you know the the modus operandi that when we do something that the that the residents know like, hey, there may be road closures, there may be diversions that aren't necessarily tied to you know um, any sp particular event, but just the sheer amount of people that we're going to have in a in a vicinity. So, um, uh, I appreciate the report and. It, also, I appreciate the, the intentionality of the multilingual outreach, specifically to whether it's Spanish or Vietnamese to, to our community. And, and, and you know, I, I, I uh, look forward to, to seeing the outreach plan develop and, and roll out and being involved as a, as, a, as a council office. Although it's not, you know, my district is in downtown and the, 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 certainly the, the cruising isn't as prevalent. Some of my, my uh, constituents did uh, have plans in downtown that you know, we're affected, and so I, I look forward to, to staying engaged and, and staying connected and act, acting as a partner to, to relay and communicate to our community. Uh, that I'll, I'll, move, I'll move the staff recommendation. Great, thank you, council member. Appreciate those comments. Councilor Baccio? The, the, um, looking at the plan which you have produced, uh, it's obviously to improve safety of the residents and the people who are celebrating any event. We just need a little clarification on this project right now is a pilot in 2024 
with only one event, even though we use generic definition of large event, but it's only Cinco de Maya only. So we do not need to be concerned about how events like 4th of July celebration in Almaden Lake or any of those happen. We will learn in 2024 uh, at the end of the year as per your plans the success of this effort and any extensions you want to do this to any other events. Is that correct? Thank you for your question, council member. Yes, we are only talking about very large crowd events and really over the last many years, as long as most of us can remember, the only event every year that really rises to the, to the scale that we are talking about is Cinco de Mayo. So all of the other events that occur throughout the city during the year, whether it be around 4th of July or even New Year's or any of those, they don't really come close to the scope that we're talking about here. Um, we are only talking about very large scale events that where there is so much congestion that it, it becomes a, a safety hazard. Thank you. And when you come back in 2024 with your report, at that time, if it is to be extended to anything more than what you already have, if you would provide a clearer definition so that people can assess whether their event falls in that category or not, and appropriately proceed in planning of that event. Okay. Yes, sir, we will include that in our report. Thank you very much. Okay. Great, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you to the department for your work on this. Um, I also want to thank my, my colleagues, Council Member Jimenez, Torres, and Candelas, as well as the uh, department um, for working towards a common goal and fostering great collaboration uh, between our partners and in, in, in law enforcement, as well as the community. Over the, over the last decade, San Jose has made a significant stride towards creating a more inclusive and, and welcoming city for all. One of the most recent developments was the unanimous decision by the previous city council to lift the, the long-standing ban on cruising, which has been a significant step towards uh, achieving this goal. Um, this memo that staff has brought is especially timely given Governor Newsom uh, signed Assembly Bill 436 uh, into law last Friday, and, and that bill essentially repeals regulations in the state vehicle vehicle code that previously allowed local governments to restrict um, lowrider vehicles or lowrider cruising. And thousands of advocates who supported this culturally significant legislation, um, the lowrider communities and car clubs from all over California uh, have pushed this bill and is exemplary of the cultural weight this holds for our community and our, Ch our Chicano community. This weight and support were also felt during Low Rider Day, um, hosted by our colleagues, including the mayor, um, as City Hall was inundated with hundreds of residents and visitors who came to see San Jose in its old glory and still holding its title of the Low Rider capital of no uh, Northern California. The purpose of our memo was to call action, urging everyone to continue to work together towards making San Jose a safer and more welcoming place for the Latino community um, and their important event. And this set path, a path forward for other major events in, in the future. The department lays out the steps they recommend ensuring that community outreach, engagement, and effective communication with all stakeholders, both car clubs and neighborhood associations, are implemented uh, going forward. I'm grateful for the expedient work and really appreciate staff incorporating our feedback into their proposed work plan. I look forward to working on comprehensive commu commu a comprehensive communication plan, um, and the police department will present to our council offices, our business community, and our community leaders a pathway forward. So I just want to thank the police department for your diligent work. Uh, of course, I want to thank the chief and, and my colleagues and the Brown Act and the council. Thank you. Great. Thank you, council member. Council member Torres? Great. Uh, thank you, Chief, and our lieutenants for, for your presentation today. And I also, just like um, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Ortiz, I'm looking forward 
on working with you regarding the communications plans that that uh, you have outlined in the in the memo. <clears throat> like I just I mentioned before in previous statements, it's uh, it's a lot of small businesses approached me the day of the weekend of Cinco de Mayo and said that they lost a lot of uh, business during the during the the you know closure of the streets. As including some uh, as far out as Twenty um, Fourth Street and William Street, and so so that's why it was important for me to 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 have these brutal conversations with you. I know um, you know there was at first there was uh, some disagreement, but of course we're as the city manager loves to say, and it's true. You know we're, we're all one team, and so uh, it's incredible that we're now working together. And just like uh, Councilmember Ortiz just mentioned, right? We know that a sanctioned event for lowriders, right, can be safe and good be for everyone. Uh, we saw it here at San Jose City Hall, and and we're hoping that we have some some type of sanctioned event for Cinco de Mayo, right, um, this coming uh, this coming year, uh, because um, we we as a city can work together to 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 make it happen, uh, and so and just. Like <laughs> Councilmember Ortiz mentioned, uh, he loves to click this request button really uh, quickly. Um, the ban has been lifted statewide now, uh, and so you know um, it's it's very important for our our lowrider council to to feel at ease being out on our on our streets because it's this 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 does mean a lot to folks. It's uh it for for many of us it brings back fond memories of of being with family and writing down. Uh, a low rider from the west side to, to to the east side and so you know we at that moment right I always felt safe right and I know that safety is a, a most important for to SJPD but our neighbors as well and so um, you know we, we we know we can do this right and and now that it's legal I think we could all work together to make sure that that everybody enjoys uh, Cinco de Mayo not just our low riding community not just our Chicano community but everybody because you saw it here at City Hall Everybody was here at City Hall, right? Uh, I saw folks that I never thought would be here enjoying a lowrider, enjoying a lowrider, right? Or seeing what's happening in, on, on our streets. So, um, so yes, so thank you so much for, for your work and I'm definitely looking forward to a robust communication plan. So uh, a lot of folks, whether they are lowriders or, or, or neighborhood leaders or business associations are not angry on that, on that weekend. So uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Council Member. I also want to uh, just thank my colleagues for their memo and thank Chief Mata and uh, the, the senior staff, everybody at PD who responded to the community's concerns and have brought back very quickly uh, a thoughtful upgrade to how we do stakeholder engagement and communication around large events. So I, I appreciate the responsiveness and my colleagues' memo. And with that, let's vote. I still have one person. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you all. Okay, we're on to item 5.1, California Department of Transportation grant for the Eastside San Jose Corridor Safety Improvement Project. No presentation on this item, though we do have staff available if there are questions. We'll start with public comment. Brian. Thank you, and I'm glad there is extra money because uh, the safety of people is very important. Um, and I support uh, more, Did it, am I heard okay? Oh, there. Am I okay? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry about it. Anyways, I ba basically agree with it and uh, anything the city can do to make things safer for people because it's still rather um, dangerous out there, as you all well, folks know. Thank you. Um, Rose, Rocio. Hi, everyone. Yes, this is Rocio Molina with Catalyze SV. Thank you so much for the consideration on this item um, and for the prioritization of safety, particularly in East San Jose. Um, this year, I had the opportunity to come and visit with some of the students 
um, in San Jose, and they were particularly concerned about some of the dangers related to, as I'm sure you've all heard as well, White Road, um, the, the walkability of their communities, and their passion for the topic was inspiring, and I definitely encourage the council and the department and BTA to continue to think of the community as valued partners and to think about these voices and the insight that they have into what's going to be most impactful in implementing these priorities and what's gonna make the most difference for the safety of their communities. Um, thank you so much and um, thank you so much for this opportunity for our communities to um, become safer and hopefully more walkable. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for this item. Thanks for the work of people on the previous item. Real good luck in uh, working out the future of the previous item. I think we can, I think be a more uh, good process for everyone. Good luck in those efforts. For this item, I wanted to uh, just comment that uh, in the issues, you know, uh, be really mindful of, of tech accountability and uh, the importance of uh, what that can add to this process and understandings. Uh, well, you're getting I think, off topic. Uh, oh, you're not talking about, there won't be uh, tech involved in the, in the future improvements of this project? I would, I would be assuming that there's gonna be a lot of tech involved in, in the future of uh, traffic improvements for this sort of project. So I feel it's important to offer my words about tech accountability. And uh, as Governor Newsom has just recently signed, uh, I think he's working toward signing the speed investment uh, uh, tech issues that San Jose has been fighting for for so much. Uh, good luck with that issue. Uh, questions of concepts of equity and that we want to practice equity well, and people are just gonna be busted <laughs> in lower income communities a lot uh, with this sort of traffic measures. Uh, there can be different ways to address traffic. Uh, good luck how we can have those conversations here in San Jose. And uh, traffic safety is important, public safety is very important, but so is uh, our civil rights and civil protections. It's a concept of working hand in hand in our future. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, Tony. Okay, colleagues, do we have questions or a motion? So moved. Second. Great. Thank you. Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. We are on to item 5. Point, no, I'm sorry. 5.2, actions related to the acquisition of property located at 32 to 60 Stockton Avenue, and we have a short staff presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development. I'm very happy here to be here today with John Risto, Jessica Zank, and Kevin Ice, who will participate in the presentation. Today, we ask council to support the purchase of the Stockton property before you. The property that is before you is a critical, a needed component of the Deardon Station Area Plan. And it's also a great example of partnership with VTA, VTA, Caltrain, all of the DISC partners, and with the property owners. The team came together to forge an agreement in a relatively short period that supports critical transit infrastructure. Jessica Zank will now provide more detail about why this parcel is needed for the rail line, and then Kevin Ice will share terms of the agreement. Good afternoon, and thank you, Nancy. Jessica Zank, Deputy Director in DOT. As Nancy mentioned and is detailed in the memo for this item, the city and its partners at the Valley Transportation Authority, Caltrain, the California High-Speed Rail Authority, and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission are working on extensive plans to comprehensively rebuild San Jose's Deerdon Station. This is in anticipation of electrified Caltrain, BART, California High-Speed Rail, the connection to the airport, among other expansions of rail and transit service. The subject properties shown here are located in the footprint of the anticipated future rail infrastructure under the Deardon Station concept layout. 
This is a really critical location at the northern throat of the rail infrastructure, and without this, we are unable to realize the established concept for the redeveloped station as we've been pursuing. As such, the city and its partners initiated uh, conversations with the landowner at the beginning of this year to discuss a voluntary acquisition of the site, and I will turn it over to Kevin Ice to review the terms of that with you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, hi, Kevin Ice, uh, Senior Real Estate Manager in the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Uh, so the acquisition of the 1.12 acre 32 and 60 Stockton property is a collaboration with the Deridon Partners uh, to secure this land that's vital to the future of Deridon Station. The property is located at the southwest corner of Stockton Avenue and West Santa Clara Street. The purchase price is $23,800,000 or $487 a foot. In addition, the city will deliver a 1033 letter to the seller. The city is playing a facilitation role in the acquisition of the property. The purchase and sale agreement that staff will negotiate and execute will be assigned to the VTA, who will then close on the property transfer. The Deridon Partners will amend the cooperative agreement for the Deridon Integrated Station to address the use of the property in the interim until it's required for the station, including city management. Interim uses may con include continuing the existing leases or development of a surface parking lot. The property will be purchased with dollars provided by Regional Measure 3. The requirement to close is conditioned on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission approving the allocation of the funds, which is scheduled to be heard by their board on October 25. The funds would be provided to the VTA, who would assume the role of buyer under the purchase and sale agreement, and they would fund escrow. The property is entitled for a 20-story mixed-use tower with 471 residential units and 7,600 square feet of ground floor retail space. The purchase price equates to $50,530 per entitled residential unit. If this tower were to be built, the cost to complete the Deridon vision would increase exponentially. The property is currently improved with an auto repair building, a car wash, and a billboard. In total, there's 16,000 square feet of building area, uh, and the structures are in poor condition and do not contribute value to the property. Environmental diligence was completed and determined there's shallow soil contamination. This contamination would require soil removal and a vapor barrier to construct the Apollo development, estimated at $416,000 if constructed with a podium. Uh, costs would be significantly less for the rail project. Title diligence is complete. Uh, there are liens on the property from unpaid taxes and a $5,600,000 deed of trust. These liabilities will be removed from title prior to closing. The sale will be as is, and the property transfer must be completed by December 31, 2023. The city facilitating this acquisition uh, on behalf of the Deridon Partners is necessary for us to secure this critically important piece of the future Deridon station now. Uh, while there is an opportunity to purchase the property. If we were to wait, we would risk the Apollo development being constructed, which would increase costs and provide a significant barrier to the California high-speed rail and Deridon, Deridon station construction projects. And with that, uh, staff are available for questions. Just one quick clarification. Just want to make sure that folks know that the property, while being transferred to DTA, will in the ultimate situation be transferred to the entity that governs Deardon Station. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, let's go to the public comment. Brian. Yeah, um, I have to take my hat off to the ladies and gentlemen and everybody that was involved. That's quite a complicated deal with all this and that's so sort of my congratulations on the speed the efficiency, the delivery of your presentation, even someone is uh, not as aware of this stuff as a possible. And the write-up that you did in the in the um, the agenda that came out. So I think it's important that we note that for people, that there's a lot of work. I'm sure you got hundreds of hours y'all folks put in to um, make this completed. So I just wanted to offer my thanks. I do hope this gets completed, uh, or at least most of it, before I go on to the 
next, uh, before I leave here, whatever way that happens, um, I'm, I'm looking at it. Some people are saying as long as 15 years. I'm not sure. But at least this is an important place to at least lay the foundation. Thanks. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for this item. Just, uh, I guess, uh, just a quick overall thank you that uh, for the work that you've done for the Deer Dawn Station area and the future of the Google Village area that this will be a part of, um, that you are considering the concepts fairly well of uh, extremely, very low and extremely low uh, income housing for the area. I think you made some interesting, uh, good choices at first. Uh, and that, uh, it's a reminder that as with the good choices we have in place now to, uh, always try to consider how to add to that. And I know it's things you already know, but just hopefully it can be a good reminder uh, just to add to the good practices of extremely low and very low income for the future of the Google Village area and with this sort of item. Thank you. Back to council. Great, thank you, Tony. Just before I turn to colleagues, Nora, I know we have one recusal on this item. We do, just... council member Torres has recused himself on this item uh, under state law. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thank you. I just want to thank staff for all their work on this item. Um, we have been working on the Deeradon Integrated Station concept plan for many years now, and this is our first, but certainly not our last, property acquisition for this project in, in hopes of expanding that station it will be after Caltrain is electrified, but um, it is very much in preparation for Caltrain electrification and expansion, as well as many other, um, many other modes of transportation, including the airport connector that will come into that place and really help grow public transit use in, in our entire city, but especially in our downtown. So I wanna thank you all for your, for your work, and I know it's been cross-agency work that you've been doing, which is something that um, we're just going to have to continue to do, not only for that area, but for many other areas in, in San Jose. So it's good to be getting that muscle all developed um, in, this, in this project. And it's always nice to spend money that's not ours. So um, with that, I will move approval of the staff recommendations. Second. Thank you, Council Member, and I'll look forward to voting to allocate that money at MTC very soon. Um, we have uh, Councilor Candelas next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make brief comments. I, I mean, I have a personal connection to this based on my previous life as a staffer for Jim Bell and, and the work we did to pass Regional Measure 3. So I appreciate staff's work on this and uh, to getting us to this point, especially with you know Urban Catalyst and my colleagues' leadership um, on this as well. So. Um, no, I, I appreciate the work, and, and you know, Duradon Station um, is gonna, uh, it's gonna be a very, very um, a busy station, and hopefully with a lot of foot traffic and a lot of uh, transit connections to give uh, folks in the region an option other than airplane and or car. So I look forward to voting on this shortly. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Council Member. Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously with Councilmember Torres recused. Great, thank you, Tony. Thanks to staff. We are moving along here. Item 8.1, which is authorization to apply for the HUD notice of funding opportunity for pathways to removing obstacles to housing. We have a short staff presentation. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager and Acting Housing Director. I'm joined this afternoon with, by Rachel Vanderveen, Assistant Director for the Housing Department. So today, uh, staff is seeking City Council approval to apply to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing, also called Pro Housing Grant Program. Uh, earlier this year in July, 
Um, HUD issued a notice of funding opportunity announcing $85 million to communities to remove barriers to affordable housing production and preservation. Uh, we see this as a tremendous opportunity for the city of San Jose. Uh, and we know that HUD intends to actually award an estimated 20 grants to communities ranging in size from $1 million to $10 million with the application due date of October 30th. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Rachel, who will share with you the eligible uses of the grant and share more about uh, staff's grant proposal. All right, thank you, Rosalind. Rachel Vanderveen, Assistant Director of the Housing Department. So I wanted to first touch on the eligible uses for this grant that we were seeking. Um, the activities include, um, activities that could be funded include further developing, evaluating, and implementing housing policy plans, improving strategies, and facilitating affordable housing production and preservation. And eligible activities must remove one or more barrier to affordable housing production and preservation. And the proposed activity must further develop, evaluate, and implement housing policies and plans, as well as facilitating affordable housing production and preservation. So as you know, San Jose remains one of the most expensive cities to live in in the United States, and displacement continues to threaten our low-income population, many of which are Latinx. And over the time frame from 2020, 2017 to 2020, the city saw a, a, a loss and decline in la Latino X um, population by 12,000 people, even as the city grew by 6,000. So many low-income households live in unsubsidized affordable housing, which is currently at risk as rents continue to rise. So as we mentioned um, recently in our study session on the three Ps, um, production, preservation, and protections, um, housing strategies, we would like to move forward in a plan and a, pro and a program that will provide preservation opportunities. Next slide. So the, the oh, <laughs> our first housing preservation notice of funding availability is ex of, of um, $5 million is expected to be released later this month. And what we would do is apply for funds in order to um, continue to fund this concept of preservation and fund this program. So what we have um, put together in the application is a, um, a grant that shows that our proposed activities clearly align with the um, priorities from HUD which include establishing loan or grant programs, um, creating mechanisms for rehabilitation of existing affordable housing, and creating anti-displacement policies and preservation measures. And so we feel that this program is the perfect alignment with what um, HUD is looking for in this grant. So we are moving right along in this timeline today. We are of course, looking for your recommendation that we move forward with this grant application. Later this week, we are going to have a virtual community meeting. Also, the grant application is available right now on the website. Um, it's available for the public to provide comment. And um, the public comment period that is required as part of the grant application, that will um, be closing up uh, later this week, and then the application will be submitted by, um, by October 30th. So um, again, we're just looking forward to conversation from you, and we're opening up this whole, um, for the remainder of this week, to the public to understand if there's any um, thoughts or comments they have on our proposal. And with that, that concludes our presentation, and we're available for any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Rachel, appreciate that. Tony, let's go to public comment. 
This is on item 8.1. Brian, followed by Blair. Thank you. That's very good that we're doing that. Um, and providing grants, I used to do that. It's very, very complicated. Appreciate the effort. Um, can, is there any way to make, I, I still work with the regional center even though I'm retired uh, as a volunteer. Um, and I still find that a lot of the, the case managers that need housing for their, for their uh, consumers uh, with developmental disabilities don't seem to gain an aspect. So one thing I'd like to add to this grant is that the regional centers and the people that provide services to people with developmental disabilities are very active in what's available on the market, what's coming to market. And it's like the thing, the, the lottery or however else they're gonna decide who gets access to the, the services. Um, it's like the people don't even get a chance to apply because they don't know where, where to apply. And these are the, the case managers. And so some way to disseminate that information within the grant process that you're trying to drop barriers would be really helpful. Thank you. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. Um, I think uh, this is one of the first reports I've heard. Thank you first, I guess, for the housing staff report um, on this item. Uh, I think it's one of the first housing staff reports I've heard uh, from Rachel Vanderveen since uh, in our, in our post-Jackie world that we're now living in. And uh, just a thank you for the presentation. It was it's nice to hear her voice. Uh, yeah, a good, it was just nice to hear this item and just get uh, informational understanding. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, Tony. Uh, as we return to council, I just want to thank our housing staff for being proactive in bringing us uh, this grant opportunity. Uh, obviously, as as the chart showed, as, as we've seen rapid economic growth, job growth, and folks moving into the area, we've also seen displacement and a reduction of our naturally occurring affordable housing. We do not have the capacity at the city level alone to counter that trend. We have to rely on federal and state partners and other entities to give us the resources we need to partner with us to address that really concerning trend. So I just appreciate that you've identified this opportunity, brought it forward and are being proactive and uh, I fully support the staff recommendation here. I'm gonna turn to my colleagues starting with council member Ortiz. Thank you, mayor. Um, and, and I wanna thank the housing department for truly great work on this grant uh, application. Uh, as we look to address our housing crisis, I continue to stress the importance of strategies like preservation uh, to ensure the affordability in the city. Um, you all presented uh, a, a graph showing the reduction of uh, affor available affordable housing units um, in the city, and that was a very sober um, statistic. Also hearing how the city is essentially bleeding members of the Latino community. You know, this, this is something that I've said many times as an activist, but now seeing in data before our eyes as a council member, it's safe to say that our Latino, Latinx community is being pushed out of our city. Um, and we do not have the means to build affordable housing at the rate that we're losing uh, uh, affordable housing units, and, and which is a major, a major cost. We're, we're, where preservation can play a role. It's not gonna be the only role, but it will plays a, a, place a, a role. So I'm, I'm hoping that this application will, will serve us as well, and thank you for the work. Uh, I did look at the housing website, um, and I didn't see any language for a specific plan. Is that still a plan of what we would do with the money? Is that still being developed, or? Okay, um, yes, it's actually, it's up on our website right oh, now. I can, I missed oh, it? <laughs> no, that's okay. That's what I get. I can follow up with an email okay. to the link so you can find it. Um, but yes, the app, our application itself is available for public comment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I also shared um, the flyer for tomorrow's meeting uh, and on my social media as well as I have a list of like community leaders um, that I email. But please let me know if there is anything else I could do to build community support or, or just you know support the, the work of staff. But thank you for your great work and um, I guess I'll move the item. Thank you. I will thank move you. the item. Great. I guess I will move the item. Thank you, yes. Council Member. Do we have a second? 
Great. Thank you, Councilmember Dewan. Appreciate those comments. Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Wonderful. Okay, great. We are on to item 8.3, actions related to the Villa del Oro Mobile Quick Build Shelter and Housing Cost Benefit Analysis. We have a staff presentation, and you all may begin whenever you're ready. VTA's board office so often I for, forgot the button. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, the staff has a short presentation and then will be available for comments. My, my name is Omar Pastens. I'm a deputy city manager for the city of San Jose, where my focus is on preventing and ending homelessness and managing its impacts. I'm joined today by Reagan Henniger, uh, deputy director of our housing department, Jim Ortball, former deputy city manager who's been leading the production effort of our emergency interim housing communities, and Matt Lesh, director of our public works department, who makes sure they actually get out of the ground when we're all ready to go. The purpose of today, today's action is to provide the mayor and council with a cost benefit analysis that, that the council directed staff to return with on the June 6, 2023 city council meeting. The city of San Jose has established a specific execution team focused on delivering these critical additions to the continuum of housing support to help people experiencing homelessness in San Jose, especially those living on our streets or in vehicles, get into housing. We are working with our Santa Clara County partners and the entire regional supportive housing system to maximize opportunities for people to get off the street and ultimately into a permanent home. Today, we will first provide some basic background for context about the scope of this issue in San Jose and our temporary solutions, uh, and then we'll share information about the specific project site, um, the details about the cost-benefit analysis, and the timeline and potential next steps. And now I'll pass it to Reagan Henninger. Thanks, Omar. Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of Housing. All right, um, news flash, we're in affordable housing crisis. Um, here is the 2023 PIT numbers, uh, and you can see over 6,200 people experiencing homelessness in San Jose. The vast majority of them are experiencing unsheltered homelessness, um, living in conditions that are not safe um, for any human being. So you can see here that the need for temporary solutions in addition to the permanent solutions is critical. Our community plan to end homelessness or our uh, regional strategic plan was adopted by Santa Clara County and this uh, mayor and council back in 2020. The plan is built on three core strategies. First is addressing the um, systemic and economic and societal causes of homelessness through systemic and policy change. The first, the second strategy really focuses on expanding our supportive housing system, uh, whether that's through permanent housing, but also preventing people from becoming homelessness. These first two strategies are, the purpose is to end and prevent homelessness for as many people as possible. However, we know that there are people suffering today and solutions are needed urgently. Um, and this third strategy is all around this immediate crisis of unsheltered homelessness and how we must increase temporary housing and shelter capacity, which will help improve the quality of life for not only the people who are suffering 
uh, living outside, but also our housed neighbors and businesses as well. This map provides some basic information about temporary housing in the city, and it's really intended to help us all zoom out and take a larger citywide perspective um, and not just a neighborhood perspective. It's based on the 2023 Federal Housing Inventory Count Report, which is maintained by our partners at the county. And it represents all forms of temporary housing, such as shelter, transitional housing, and it also includes the city's uh, interim housing and bridge housing communities. As I mentioned, the need exists across the city, and the mayor and council have directed a citywide approach. And this, pro this approach is equitable for two reasons. First, it gives people who do not have shelter and are living outside an opportunity to get off the street. Rather than having to go to unfamiliar parts of town for support. And second, this map indicates the current emergency system is most concentrated in specific parts of San Jose, specifically in districts three, six, and seven, with the more recent additions in South San Jose and District Two. So next I'll turn it over to Jim Ortball, who'll talk about the city's current active projects across the city before going into the Via del Oro project. Thank you, Regan. Uh, good afternoon. So from that citywide overview of the entire emergency housing system, this next slide focuses on non-congregate interim housing sites and supportive parking projects that are approved and under development or in the case of the Via del Oro site in front of council today for approval. So we have five sites and projects in various stages of approval design and development, including the Ruferari expansion. It is in the RFP procurement stage for a design builder. We have the Berryessa supportive parking project that is in final design. We have the Cerrone site that passed a major milestone on October 5th with the VTA board of directors unanimously approving use of a VTA site for 200 state small homes. We have the Cherry Avenue site that is in the concept development and lease development stage, and Via del Oro, which is the main topic for today. So next I'll provide an overview of the site and the project organization. So as a reminder, the site in orange or yellow uh, up on the slide, it is in Council District 10. It's at the corner of Via del Oro and San Ignacio Avenue on a private site of over two plus acres of vacant land. The project concept would use about 1.5 acres of the site. The owner is John Sobrato. It is in a commercial industrial zone of the city across from a large vacant lot and surrounded by other commercial industrial uses. So the site and project provides the city with a unique and really substantial opportunity. First, the land is being offered and donated to the city by John Sobrato for $1 per year for a five-year period. At the end of the five-year period, the city would need to find a new location to re relocate the sleeping cabins and facilities. Second, the project is being organized and developed by Dignity Moves, the other major philanthropic partner in the project. Dignity Moves has developed the concept. They've teamed with capable partners, Gensler Architects and, and Swinerton Construction. All of them have prior experience on these types of projects. Of great value to the city is the proposed philanthropic donations of sleeping units, furniture, and lower design and construction fees totaling over $3 million to the city. That $3 million is at a level that supports direct negotiation with this team. And I think it's appropriate at this point to acknowledge the major contributions of the principal partners that have gotten us to this point. John Sobrato for the land donation. Joanne Price, the lead for Dignity Moves. She's organized the concept, the team, and is leading on fundraising along with her uh, partners at Dignity Moves and is the overall driver behind the project. 
Drew Armetta from Gensler, the lead architect, very capable architectural firm, and Sean Flayhive from Swinnerton, the lead construction manager. Thanks to each of them for, for responding so generously and professionally to this community need. So this project is providing the city an opportunity to test potential innovations that can help us address the shelter crisis more quickly, creatively, and at lower cost. And a few examples on this slide illustrate that point. This will be the first project of this type in San Jose on private land. We've done all of our previous projects on public lands. The goal through philanthropy is to unlock more private sites to enable faster leasing, which places a premium on the mobile quick build process. And we're trying to push the envelope of rapid concept, design, and build in this project. We have city staff working directly alongside designers, engineers, and construction managers very early in the concept phase versus a more typical sequential process with the goal of speed to occupancy. And a specific example on the design side is the planned use of solar panels and a partial microgrid to power the site, a first for a city interim housing site. Take it to the next slide, I'd appreciate that. There we go. So this slide here, I'm going to kind of go into the scope of the project as well. So this slide shows the type of planned sleeping cabinets to be used. We're, we're a plan to use duplexes. The approach uses a hybrid model be, uh, between the individual single occupant cabins at our first BHC site and the more recent multi-unit EH buildings that house about three to five people. These units will have one solar panel unit to power the two separate sleeping cabins of the duplex. A little bit more on what will be included. You can see there uh, on the slide, perimeter fencing, 75 sleeping cabins for up to 150 people, a security kiosk, kitchen and picnic areas, central laundry and central private restroom and shower facilities, It'll comply with all relevant city interim housing codes and provide support services, case management, and security with the express goal to graduate people to permanent housing. This slide here shows kind of a concept of how we intend to organize and integrate the site. We would have entry off of San Ignacio Avenue. All of the white rectangles are the sleeping cabins. The central area are the restroom and shower facilities, the laundry facilities. The orange uh, towards San Ignacio are the kitchen, case management, uh, administration buildings, and those types of things. That's kind of the layout. And then uh, kind of the, the main direction that we got from council was to do a substantial cost-benefit analysis on the project. Uh, in June, we were directed to do that and to bring that back for community review and for council consideration. The methodology factored in major costs and major benefits, and one of what I'm about to present to the council was presented to the community on October 2nd. Mayor Mahan, Councilmember Batra, and Councilmember Jimenez were present for that community meeting. The major cost elements are project organization design and construction. They would be all Dignity, Gensler, and Swinnerton costs. Design approval, code compliance, inspection, and permitting by the City Public Works Department and contingencies in preparation for potential unforeseen events, and then future demobilization and relocation costs in fiscal year 28-29. And then the major benefits are a faster design-build approach with the goal to complete the entire project by mid-2020-24 before any other project on our current docket would open. And we have an experienced philanthropic team donating over $3 million to the city we're testing the mobile quick build approach. We're using solar panels and reducing, putting this in effect, we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions and utility operating costs. We're getting the land for $1 per year. And most importantly, we're housing up to 150 people sooner than we can in any other project and prioritizing people in encampments that are nearest the site. And so now for the numbers. I think this table, shows the total estimated cost at the concept stage to deliver the project this fiscal year. 
The first three line items would be incurred by our partners, Dignity, Gensler, and Swinerton, including purchasing the modular buildings. City project delivery and contingency is controlled by Public Works, and the philanthropic donations and discounts reduce over $3 million from the total estimated cost to deliver the project this year. The total estimated cost is approximately $11.3 million. Again, we only have the site for five years, so at the end of five years in 2028-29, the city must decommission the site at an estimated cost of $500,000. And if we wish to continue using the sleeping cabins and the other buildings, we, we must find another site to relocate. And the cost estimated in 2028-29 dollars is between five and $6.2 million to find that site, to prepare that site, and to move the buildings to that site and open. And then this next slide really speaks to the relative value and comparative value of the site and the project. Uh, the first table on this slide compares the estimated costs of the Via del Oro mobile quick build project to three other city projects, two built and one being ready for, readied for award. As you can see, the Via del Oro estimate of $75,000 per bed compares favorably to all projects, including the original Mayberry BHC and the Guadalupe EIH, our most recently completed project, and the planned Ruferari expansion. At this point in our city's development evolution on these types of projects, Via del Oro, the, the project and the approach seems to be the most cost-effective way to deliver these types of projects today. The second table makes a different type of comparison that recognizes that the city will only have the Via del Oro site for five years, and, compares, and it compares against other projects on a five and 10 year amortization basis, and we're trying to equalize the period because we know we're only gonna have this site for a five year period. On this basis, the Via del Oro project still competes well against the other projects. The cost benefit in years six to 10 as shown in the 10 year amortization does not track at quite the same reduction rate as the other projects because the city is likely to bear the relocation costs at the end of five years to get utilization in that period of time from six to 10 years. But overall, on a per bed basis, a five year basis, and even a 10 year basis, it's either the lowest cost per bed or it is very much in that range on a per month amortized basis. The bottom line, this mobile quick build project we think is the most efficient way we can go at this point in time. And I'll turn it back over to Omar for the remainder of the slides. We were also um, asked or directed by council to um, consider evaluation of enhanced services within one mile radius of the site. And so we went ahead and, and did that. And as you can see from the slide, there are various items that we included in those enhanced services. This I think we're on the wrong slide. Sorry. If we can just oh. get the right slide up for everyone. Oh, yeah. There it is. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as, uh, as noted, there are several uh, items. We've uh, come before the council before with a set of enhanced services for review. So when that direction came, we went back and, and looked at uh, these enhanced services, and you can sort of see uh, some of those items that are considered there. The, the preliminary cost range estimate for those enhanced services is between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, we, we do have uh, representatives from our Parks Recreation and Neighborhood Services Department if uh, the Mayor and Council have questions about, uh, more questions about that piece. Um, in terms of the recommendations, our recommendations are to accept the staff report uh, for the Via del Oro site and this mobile quick build project, uh, to direct staff to negotiate a land lease with John Sobrato for that one dollar per year for five years that we discussed, and to direct staff to negotiate a project delivery agreement with Dignity Moves and Swinerton Construction for council uh, consideration. We, we would note uh, that there were uh, other memos brought forward uh, as it relates to this item. We, we think that uh, we have offered what we think is the, a good approach for the city to take and we'll sort of hold for, for those as they, as they come about. And the last thing I will mention is the sort of next the timeline piece. Um, you know, we are in this late 23, 24 uh, period. If we're directed to move forward, uh, then we would, would be pushing for uh, getting back here for city council approval early to mid 2024 if that 
uh, uh, project delivery agreement approval happens, we'd really be in, in that construction phase. And just as with all of the, depart the sites that the housing department works with the providers for, there would be a community advisory committee to focus to make sure that communities continue to have an ongoing uh, relationship there. Uh, that, that concludes our, uh, our presentation. I do have, I don't know if it will play for those that have not seen, it's a short one minute video that just helps put a face to what we're talking about. I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy because it's a room, there's a bed, uh, showers, laundry. You know, for me, it's been great. It's, I feel they're real helpful. If you ask them a question, it'll lead you the right way. And with that, staff is available for questions. Great, thank you. Um, I have a few thank yous to give, but we'll, oh, but we will, uh, I'll do that when we come back to council. Let's start with public comment. Um, I think it's Cecilia. I think it's Cecilia, I could say Gilia, um, followed by Francesca and Gail. And Tony, were those in person? Yes, the, sorry, these are in-person speakers. So I have Celia, Francesca, and Gail. Great. And I have more names um, after those three of in-person. I also have a few hands online. I don't think there's Cecilia here. Um, I'm Francesca Paste, and on behalf of my mother, Maria Scochels, I want to take this opportunity and really thank the generosity of John Sobrato. I know he's behind a lot of this um, funding for housing and interim housing, um, and I'm very excited to hear that those closest to it would be eligible. Um, I want to say thank you to the council for the Arena Hotel for taking an entire community of unhoused from the Waz area. Um, we met with them and they were having a little community outreach and um, vet uh, support and they are thrilled to be there. So, you know, remembering that our unhoused neighbors build communities and being able to house their community is, is you know, I think makes the transition even better better. So thank you, and I hope we get a unanimous vote. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, also, Joanne Price, come on down. You get two minutes. Hi, I'm Julia Archibald. Um, I've been in house for many years. I currently live on Great Oaks. I'm, um, I was told I would get housing by my home first worker, but it never happened because my ID and social security card was stolen. My case manager, my case manager never came back to help me replace the document, so I've lost hope. I now work with Claire, a volunteer, and got my documents replaced. But having seen my case manager, this is not a unique experience. But you, the city, keep giving these nonprofits the contracts. I can only hope Dignity Moves does a better job. Hi, Gail Osmer here. I want to first of all thank um, Council Member Jimenez. 
Um, I invited him out to meet with the folks at Great Oaks. Um, Gigi lives at Great Oaks with along with other unhoused people. Um, a couple of people were going to come today. They went for job interviews, and one had a doctor's appointment. So thank you, um, Council Member Jimenez, for coming out and meeting with the folks, hearing what they have to say, and trying to work with them. We really appreciate it. And my friend Batra, thank you so much for this memo. And thank you for all your work with the unhoused, especially at the RV safe parking. This is wonderful. I had a meeting on um, Sunday with all the residents out there at Great Oaks. They're very happy for this to be coming online. Um, I don't see the time, but um, the they want it now. Let's get it going. We need this housing. Thank you, everybody. I hope, I know you will support it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because they don't want to live outside. They don't want to, they don't want to live like this. Um, they want to be inside. I also want to thank Beautify for coming out there and cleaning up. They do clean up. They do come out there. The residents put all their trash in one area, which the council members saw, and they come in and they pick that all up. This is the family, and they want to be sticking and staying together. So thank you very much. Um, I already called Joanne Price. I want to add Giru Surrender and Elizabeth Funk. Good afternoon, Council. Um, thank you very much for hearing this item. I do want to thank, sincerely thank staff who have worked tirelessly with us on this project. I should say I'm one of the co-founders of Dignity Moves. And I can say when I started my journey in the nonprofit and helping solve our housing problem, our housing crisis, I didn't think where we'd be today. I thought Home Key Mountain View blew us away, but here we are today with a truly revolutionary concept where we're taking land that would otherwise sit vacant, waiting for years in entitlements to put units, units that are now costing 75,000, and this is going to be truly relocatable. It's also Silicon Valley's first solar-powered community, entire housing community powered by solar. And as such, it's creating a lot of interest. And just two seconds ago, I got text from one of our large philanthropic donors who's willing to put a huge pledge towards this project because he believes in it. So thank you, Preston Butcher. Lastly, I just want to end by saying we have worked on sites where they've implemented no sleeping ordinances around these sites and they prioritize people living within the vicinity of the sites and it works. And I think this being the, an innovative, uh, innovative project that it is and it's only temporary, then why can't we like try a pilot of a no sleeping ordinance around, around this site too? So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, uh, Surrender. Uh, I just wanted to advocate my support for this uh, site, the Via del Oro. Um, when people don't have to worry about where they're going to sleep and they feel safe, then their minds are more creative to create a beautiful personal reality and a future that is prosperous. And that's our responsibility for them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Funk. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Dignity Moves, the organization that's proposing to help with this project. And I just wanted to say how honored I am to be a part of such a program and with a city that is taking such a leadership position on treating homelessness as the crisis that it is. Unfortunately, we're seeing so many cities who have, have become immune, have decided it's just the way it is, there's nothing that can be done. San Jose is really a leader in saying, no, it's not the way it is, and it can be solved. And taking innovative approaches, there's no surprise that it's Silicon Valley that is innovating around fully off-grid and relocatable and mass-produced. And let's get everybody indoors. I don't know that people realize how much it costs us, a society, to leave people on the streets. Certainly, it's annoying to walk by them, but the cost to our system. And so getting people indoors quickly can redirect those resources to things that are more productive and more permanent solutions. I'm just really honored to see this city taking that leadership, happy to be a part of it. 
thankful and grateful for the philanthropic community because we're going to be calling you guys. We haven't raised it yet, but we are determined to do it because I know the citizens here um, feel the same way about the pride of their city and, and helping to take care of all the neighbors around them. Thank you. Going to Zoom, I have Issa followed by Sobrato. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Issa Ajloni. With over 500 beds in a concentrated area, I'm asking the Council to consider what other city councils in California have already done, and that is no encampment, no sleeping zones. If you find yourself struggling with this request, then consider this. This is a temporary site, so why not include no encampment, no sleeping zone as a temporary pilot program and see how it goes. I have also heard concern this will cost too much. So if you feel this way, then put a cap on that cost just for the no encampment, no sleeping zone piece of it. And once the cap is reached, then the abatement can end. This will give the city of San Jose a real cost assessment of these kind of services. With all this said, I encourage you all to support Council Member Batra's memo, along with the mayor, with an additional of no encampment, no sleeping zone. I was really glad to hear Gail speak of the family on Great Oaks Boulevard and that they're looking forward to move in. And uh, if they do move in, then there's, you know, not going to be a problem. But we as a city should try to learn how to give the carrots out like we have, but also encourage them to move in by saying move in or move out of the, the area. Might seem a little strong, but um, I think it's reasonable because Rona Park, San Francisco, and Sacramento are already doing it. Thank you for, your, for hearing my comments. Sobrato followed by Brian. It's a Sobrato fangirl. Um, bleeding Latinos, that's literally true as they are disproportionately represented among the unhoused deaths. I'm a big fan of John Sobrato and his projects. However, I wish he would meet with unhoused people and advocates to hear directly from them about the issues with projects like this. I support the project, I just have concerns. I know the mayor loves these tiny homes, but with no PSH really on the horizon, these tiny homes are honestly just human warehouses. You're warehousing humans so you can say you got them off the street, but many of them will still maintain their RVs or tents because that's where their belongings are and where they really live their life. Communal bathrooms aren't equitable for disabled and senior folks. This is on the south side again. This doesn't offer relief for people on the north who are tied to the north because of tattoos or similarly people on the east. I definitely hope that you oppose a no sleeping zone around the area. It just, it's, you know, it's just mean. If you don't change the vendors, you will not improve the outcomes. With home first issues, with disproportionately firing black employees, hiring employees who do drugs on duty at tiny homes, and doctoring case management records in HMIS, you will continue to provide a disservice to the unhoused community. Life moves and abode are woefully inept at providing in inadequate services to people. The cruel treatment that life moves intentionally inflicted upon seniors and disabled folks at Church Day has been well documented. Abodes failures and PSH are also well documented, starting with Second Street Studios. The unhoused community deserves new vendors. Brian, followed by Dai. Thank you. I, I also do support the project, but I do think there needs to be very stringent accountability on the part of the providers. Sometimes I think that just um, there's not oversight, and um, that's been an ongoing issue, and it's been an ongoing issue where commented by people who actually utilize those services, good and positive and negative uh, reports. But I just I hope there's a real strong tie to that. And, and um, maybe after five years trying to see if there's a way to finalize this stuff. And I really want to thank the, the gentleman donating the land. Everybody thinks we're rich and all that and blah, blah, blah. You know, he didn't have to do this. And one dollar a, a year for five years is better than no land at all. So that's a step in the right direction too. Thank you. Di Allred, followed by Gina.
Okay, moving on to Gina, followed by Lee. Hi, thank you. This is Gina Whitney. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'm a resident in the area like Issa. Um, I guess we haven't heard from many of the folks in this area where we have really a number of um, uh, emerg in interim housing sites. On the maps that you show, I often don't see, we don't see the RV site or the other one on Monterey, but within just two, uh, two miles of my house, there, there are three of them now. This will be a fourth. Um, my concern is that we haven't seen any decrease in the number of unhoused folks uh, in the area. If anything, it almost seems to be an increase. We are becoming the you know, South San Jose homeless friendly neighborhood. And there are areas that used to uh, basically seem safe to go ride your bike or, or walk over to the uh, Coyote Creek, Creek Trail, which no longer feel that way. Um, so what I would really strongly um, recommend, I appreciate the fact that the um, uh, folks in the nearby area will be given priority in terms of housing um, in the new uh, in this new place. But uh, I really strongly support the proposal of the mayor and of, of con uh, Councilman Boutra uh, to um, have no require no encampments in this area. If we're going to put out this housing, then we need people to get really off the street and into the interim housing. Um, I guess I, I have one more question. I don't know if you answer questions, but isn't this the same site that was going to be a, 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 new, a El, new El Camino hospital? And I guess the other comment I have or question is, um, it seems like you've been working on this for quite some time, but it's really only come out in the local uh, newspaper or even emails really today. So it's a little disappointing. Lee? Okay, back to council. Thank you. All right, so we come back to council. I wanna start with a few thank yous. There are a number of people who have brought us to this exciting point. And I, I wanna start, of course, with the uh, person who kicked it all off with a phone call back in March, which is John Sobrato. And as you all know, John and Sue Sobrato are legendary for their philanthropy. I think what's been especially exciting about the way that John and Sue have engaged in homelessness is that they've encouraged innovation. We've seen them make a $5 million contribution to the site that's currently under construction at Brandon and Monterey, first site in our city to go three stories high, better utilizing the land and giving us density, even including kitchenettes in case we one day want to convert that to something more permanent. This is a case where we are looking at flexibility and efficiency. And what's especially exciting and innovative about this site that I think we should not undercount the importance of as we, as we learn and, and find better and more cost-effective approaches is that it gets private property into the game, into the effort to end street homelessness. There is a lot of underutilized privately held property that up until this point has sat on the sidelines because there hasn't been a good replicable model for getting those private property owners engaged. And so this site, in addition to helping potentially 150 people at a time, gives us the opportunity to stand up a site quickly, cost effectively, with the minimal, the necessary utility hookups, but doing it in such a way that when necessary, it can also be disassembled and relocated. And so when you think about what this could mean over time, if this site works, we could potentially have multiple quick builds on private property that's sitting on the sidelines, hundreds of acres of which is out there, just in San Jose, and be able to rotate those communities around the city when those sites become viable for development. And so this could really significantly scale up our approach here, give, make many more sites available to us. When we did our initial analyses, we really just looked at public agency land. This opens up a whole other 
avenue for accelerating the rate at which we create safe and dignified alternatives to our encampments. So I want to thank John and Sue Sobrato for being willing to lease the city a very valuable parcel of land for $1 a year for five years. That's an incredible contribution. And for pushing us and encouraging us and other cities to innovate and try new things, which is, which is to me the most exciting piece of this. That call, uh, when John called me in March, led to a follow-up conversation with Dignity Moves. And you heard from Elizabeth Funk and Joanne Price, who in their own right are incredible leaders and experts uh, in this fight to end homelessness across the state and have done incredible work in other communities as well. And so we're very lucky to have Dignity Moves here wanting to bring this model to San Jose, being willing to go out and pull together the private philanthropy. You just heard that Preston Butcher, who's also a great philanthropist, is willing to sign up to help defray the costs. So I'm just incredibly excited to partner with Elizabeth and Joe and the, the team at Dignity Moves. So thank you for helping us to accelerate our efforts to end homelessness. Um, have to also thank and I know it's a long list, but I've got to thank Omar Passens and Jim Ortball. When I first floated this to them, uh, they were already, you know, and, and not just them, but the teams here across city manager's office and, and housing and public works were already in the process of opening the Santa Teresa safe parking site. We were talking about safe parking at Berryessa. We were looking for a site for the 200 units from the governor, which just as was mentioned, are going to be landing at Cerrone up in District 4. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. Obviously, Arena Hotel was in flight and recently opened. Brandon and Monterey is under construction. Council Member Foley's working with you all on the site at Cherry Ave and the, and, and the, the, the effort there. We've got Rue Ferrari expansion in flight. So we had a lot going on. And I'm really grateful to our staff that you were willing to see that this could be another model, a unique opportunity, and that you were willing to jump on it but also approach it thoughtfully. Because the one big concern I think we've all had with this model is if you might have to shut it down and move it in five years, does it make sense financially? Is this actually going to be better for the taxpayers and for our community? and give us leverage, and you went and did that analysis, and it turns out, thankfully, the answer is yes, which is incredibly exciting. So I just, I have to really thank Jim Omar and the team for doing this thorough cost assessment while, you know, thinking about a half dozen plus other sites in parallel. And then, last but certainly not least, Council Members Jimenez and Batra, um, this is actually in District 10, uh, were, were both willing, and Council Member Batra just joined the Council, willing to dig in, understand the model, talk with John Sobrato, with the neighbors, of course, a few of whom you heard from this evening, with Dignity Moves, and have been there along the way making sure the community's heard and have been offering really constructive feedback along the way. So I want to thank them. I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank Mackenzie Mossine and Alejandra Lena Chantris and on my team who have also been deeply involved in the entire process. So here we are, six months later, we've done the analysis, we've been moving all these other sites in, in uh, parallel, and we've got a new model here and the opportunity to test something new and scalable and cost effective that will save lives. So I'm very proud that we're here at this moment, that we have this innovative variation on our EIH model. I do want to just say, I know we have a couple of memos. I co-signed both of them, and we're going to have to do a little bit of reconciliation here <laughs> around making sure that these two match up. I think most of what's in the memos makes a ton of sense and is not hopefully not controversial. I think the one thing that we'll be talking about here as I turn to my colleagues is this, no, this question of how do we give the immediate neighborhood an assurance that we're going to follow through on this idea that when we move forward solutions to homelessness, the neighborhood's made better, not worse off. That's something people deservedly want to want to see. They want to understand how it is that we're going to make sure that this is actually a net win for everybody. It's, an, it's a win for those who are out in the encampments. It also makes the neighborhood better off. Thankfully, I just want to note this for the record, what we have seen across the six quick build or interim EIH sites we've stood up in the last three years is that in aggregate, we've actually seen calls for service for crime and blight go down within a small radius, I believe it's a quarter mile radius around each of these sites. But even so, I think we're gonna to need to discuss as we do with each site, what's particular to this site. At Cherry Ave, we've talked about the water resource protection zone. Each site is a little bit different and we have to take into account the nuances and the experience of the community around a site and think about how we can 
be as responsive as possible to the community's needs as we move forward to these sites. So I think that's where our conversation will go. I'd caution us against creating sweeping blanket policies that are set in stone versus piloting an approach as we're talking about doing at Cherry Ave, which is different, again, from what we might do at Cerrone. So I think we need to acknowledge that each site, each neighborhood is a little different and is an opportunity for learning. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Again, incredibly grateful to the Sobrados, to our friends at Dignity Moves, city staff, and everybody, and my colleagues who have, who have gotten us to this exciting point. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Councilmember Batra, in whose district this site would uh, be built. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, staff, for the extensive analysis and development of the proposal. And I want to acknowledge the innovative approach or the uh, John Sabrado actually making the call rather than us going to him. That in itself is opening up a new opportunity, new model, because when we make this one successful and everybody appreciates in the community that Mr. Sobrato did something good, we believe other properties, other philanthropists will open up their doors to solving the same problem which Mr. Sobrato and Dignity Moves together are doing. So with that stated, I do have a couple of questions, which uh, Mr. Passon would have expected. <laughs> so Mr. Passon, I'm just going to lead you through a couple of questions. Uh, now, how many people are we expecting to position in these, this particular Via Delora site? Uh, Council Member Bacha, we're looking at up to 150 folks. I will tell you, given that we're a team, some of your questions, I might phone a friend from uh, Parks and Recreation or elsewhere, but yeah. 150, okay. about 150. Yeah, okay. And what is our typical duration when we get an unsheltered person to move into the shelter and they get a chance to rebuild their life in this sheltered environment? Hi, Council Member. Can I just clarify your question? Is your question, uh, what's the time that it would take for someone who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness once they move on to our interim site? How long would it take them to move on or exit the program to other housing? Is that yeah. your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, our data across all of our sites right now is uh, between six and nine months. Sorry, what was the last statement you made? Our data across all of our sites, so this is like rolled up data, not for any one specific site. It generally takes six to nine months for an individual to move on to about transitional days. or permanent okay. housing. So let me, let me see what I, so where I'm trying to go with that. It's about 170 days is what I've seen, right? And if, if that number is correct, what this says is during this five years, we will have a chance to have 1,500 unsheltered people because we will go through two batches of each in a year. In five years, we'll have 10 batches would have gone through, which is about 1,500 people would have moved from unsheltered to a sheltered environment to build their life. And I'm going to use, I'm not going to ask you a question. You also have a number that about 50% of the ones who go through our shelter process, they end up in permanent locations, whatever that permanent location is. That means this particular project, even if done for five years, is going to give 1,500 people a chance to rebuild their life and at least 750 of those are going to graduate into their permanent homes. That is the impact of this philanthropic effort. I just wanted to make, because you put in a lot of effort in showing how the costs were better, I just wanted to bring it out. The real benefit is not that this is a cheaper site, 
what it is doing is for 1,500 people or 750 people. And that's what I want to thank Mr. Sobrado and the Dignity Moves for the great contribution it's going to make to solving our homelessness problem. Okay, so now coming strictly to the Via del Oro's, um, the community around it, as we promise that anywhere we put an EIH, we take out the encampments from nearby, and we already stated that we're gonna give a prioritization. So when we clean up the encampment, obviously the community should be better. And in my memo, I have asked that we have intuitively made those statements. We would like it to be shown by collection of the data. Now we have an opportunity before and after so that the community can believe it with the data that yes, the community improved. We all know that community should improve and your previous intuitive experience is yes, it does. But in this one, we are asking specifically, let's use this as a scientific way to get there and prove that, okay? And the second part is we know that anywhere we create EIH, we are addressing the needs of the unsheltered extremely well. You have studied those needs and you provide those needs very well. There is still some concern among the people who are living around it that do they get looked after as well as or not, or the neighborhood does get looked at. And that's why we wanna make sure those basic services which we talk about keeping the cleanliness and all, we live up to our commitment and we make sure that we do uh, provide all that stuff properly. And now, I asked in the last meeting for the extended services or enhanced services you price those based on what your previous experience was. Neither the community nor us, we were expecting it to be that deep uh, and hence services. So I would say when we build this thing, please keep in mind the services which these people are looking for and what we are providing. If there is even, even a gap does exist or not because the services, if we are saying it keeps it everything clean, we cleaning graffiti clean, moving the dumps and everything, uh, illegal dumping removed, then there should be no need for any enhanced services, okay? So please review in this process when you're looking that what is it really the community complaining about if there is really, is it we are not delivering what we said we are delivering and we had some omissions or is it really the gap between what the community wants and we really are providing? So I would say that please keep that in mind. In order to make this site a extremely successful from the people who are gonna live in there and the people who are living around them, that model of success is going to lead us to having multiple more sites like these and public-private partnership will grow and we'll be able to solve the problem which we are challenged to solve today. With that, I would like to move for approval of the recommendations contained in the memo submitted by the mayor and myself, as well as the memo submitted by mayor and council members Jimenez, Cohen, and Foley. Second. Great, thank you. Let me give it to Council Member Jimenez, just given uh, that this was formerly his district, I know he's done a tremendous amount of work in engaging the community and, and listening to community members and making sure their voices are heard. Um, but thank you, Councilor Batra. appreciate your motion. Second from Jimenez. And uh, Councilor Batra, was that all? Uh, yes. Thank you. thank you. All right, Council Member Foley. Thank you, thank you for bringing this forward and uh, thank you to John Sobrato for his generosity in letting us use his land for 150 EIHs for the low cost of $1 a, a year. That's uh, very generous and uh, I'm grateful for his philanthropy and generosity to the community. 
Uh, I've been a long, I, I also want to thank the team presenting, uh, Omar and team. Uh, this is really exciting to see more interim housing units come forth to the city of San Jose. I've been a supporter of these, and as you all know, I've been an advocate of trying to bring one into District 9, so don't be surprised that I'm going to ask you about the status of that one, uh, because initially, or in the memo, it looks like it's an alternate, so I want to, I know that it's not, but I want to hear that it isn't going to be an alternate, that we're moving speedily uh, in, in that direction as well. I also want to congratulate you for the success that we had at Cerrone, that we have 200 units from the governor coming in there, and that's uh, 200 additional units and will go a long way to reach our goal of 1,000 units. We, we may surpass our 1,000 units. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, I truly believe that we all need to share in housing uh, the unhoused by creating these interim housing units. This is not the salute, the end of homelessness, it's just a step. It's a step that takes the unhoused off the street, puts them in a building with a roof, and in some cases, and with doors that lock and some privacy uh, with bathrooms. I know these units may not have private bathrooms, uh, but hopefully we can adjust for that or that, that will be uh, addressed. I know privacy is really, really important. And I am very excited to see this at uh, Via del Oro. I know that District 2, now District 10, um, has hosted many of these EIHs, and I want to thank that community and the council member there for really uh, being gracious in allowing those units to come in to Council Member Jimenez. These all started in your area, but now are through redistricting in District 10. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about this and I want to see these move forward. I really am proud or excited about the public-private partnership that this opens up. There's a lot of land out there that is owned privately sitting vacant like this one that may be not be developed or utilized in a few years, so a five-year model makes sense and maybe there's someone else listening to this who has a generous spirit and has some land and might want to uh, help us with this, help us solve a very, uh, very much a crisis of humanity situation. So uh, just a couple questions. I want to, so, so that's a long way of saying thank you, I'm grateful, can't wait for this to move forward, can we start moving people in now? I know we can. So what is the timing on uh, moving off Via del Oro? What is the timing on Cherry? And please reassure me that it's not on the back burner. So uh, council member, I will say uh, for, it is absolutely not on the back burner. Um, all five of the sites that uh, you heard the mayor re reference earlier are priorities for us. We have an execution team set up um, under Matt's leadership in terms of public works to really drive. Uh, we are uh, have been in contact even since that uh, VTA uh, board vote to make sure that the license agreement is moving forward. We can't give you an exact timeline today in this, this meeting because we're working with a, a partner. And, and so what I would say is our pledge is to be committed, aggressive, and focused on delivering relief for people, including in District 9. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Anything, again, we can do to help or even identify future sites, please let us know. You know we're out there and we want to help be the solution to the homeless crisis too and not just a, a barrier in the middle of the way. Thank you for that, Councilmember Foley. I think your, your community members have been very good about proactively reaching out in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. We as staff very much appreciate when they come with sort of thoughtful engagement and how they can really help us move things forward. So we're genuinely appreciative. If you have other community members that are similarly interested, we am always open to take calls and, and, and that sort of thing. I, uh, I, I appreciate that. And I will say that area of District 9 where the Cherry Avenue is, we worked really hard to get their consensus and their approval as to why this would be a benefit for everyone in that area. So we just do need to make it so, and we'll, we'll help you with that along the way. With that, I yield my time. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Mayor. 
I just yes. had one clarifying question about the Jimenez memo. I think we need to be able to just have our uh, legal folks have, uh, if we could change it to explore the prioritization, not for the, um, not for the immediate priority like the top one. We already have a pre that's local for preference. recommendation two. Yeah, that's right. So, so the not the not two A. I think that actually is 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 within the ambit of the pre preference. But I think the other ones we really I think we need time as staff to go back yeah. and, and analyze. So if just to clarify, when you say explore, I want to make sure Councilor Jimenez can respond. Um, beyond explore, I think the intention of the council would be if the city attorney deems it legally feasible to do, pursue the rest of the recommendation. Is that correct? Is that Councilor Jimenez's okay. intention? Yes. Great, I just wanted to is make that, sure. We, are you that's comfortable right, with that's that? That's okay. Okay, and is the maker of the motion comfortable with that? Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I was distracted. That's okay, I, I'll, I'll repeat uh, the, yeah. the Staff preference, which your second or Councilor Jimenez is okay with, is that for recommendation two of the memo signed by Council Members Jimenez, Cohen, Foley, and myself, that for Rec two, it's conditional upon the city attorney determining that it is legally feasible, doesn't expose us to unnecessary risk of litigation. Just for clarity, we were only asking that for B, C, and D. I think 2A is actually essentially our current uh, Correct. preference, just widened good, out a little good bit. Good flag. So yeah. for this, for recommendations 2, B, C, and D, not A, on the group, the other group memo. Oh, yes. So I already said that we are inserting, uh, accepting the memo from uh, the group. Yeah. This so is ju just clarifying that the city attorney will do the legal analysis to ensure that those recs are, are feasible and that she's comfortable with the city moving forward. So, so that uh, the priority developed in the item number two is that we were talking about here? Not the memo that you and I co-authored, the other memo. This yeah, is the, the other memo the is preference the list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so in, in that one, the item number two is what we are saying? Yeah, item two is developing a preference list for yes. shelter placements. Right. And for sub points B, C, and D, staff would simply like the council to include that that rec moves forward if and when the city attorney determines that it's legally feasible for us to do so. Yes, definitely okay. yes. Uh, okay. While you give me the chance, can I make one comment? I will come back to you. We're in okay. the middle of someone else's time. Okay. I'm sorry. I think Council Member Foley had wrapped up, I'm done. Yeah. and we are on to Council Member Dewan, and then I will circle. If you'll put your hand up, Council Member, I'll come back to you in a moment. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. This is what I call success when private and public collaboration. I want to take the opportunity to thank you um, to John Sobrato and Dignity Move. Um, and thank you to our staff, Omar Passion, Jim Orball, Matt Lesh, and uh, Reagan Henninger. I do have one question. Is there a contingency plan if in five years the department cannot identify another civic-minded philanthropists? So I'm gonna start that and then maybe pass down the, down the mic. I, I think the reality is that we collectively will be looking for alternatives, but it's hard to predict the future. The, the, the desires of the, the sort of landscape of other sites and other parts of the city, things may evolve, and so we need the opportunity to go and look and then come back to, to council. But I don't know if Jim. I, I think that's accurate, Omar. I, I would say our priority now is to deliver on the five sites and projects we have in front of us. That That is the most important. Once we get through that, Councilmember, I think we'll look to where are our opportunities to go with this site after the five-year period. So I, th I think we'll still have enough time, you know, in, in years uh, two, three, four, to, to zero in on that and, and to advance an opportunity. And just to clarify, sorry to interject, but I want to make sure I'm interpreting this correctly. In the very unlikely uh, circumstance in which we do not find a, a site to relocate to, the cost of essentially decommissioning this site is estimated to be $500,000. $500,000. So that's baked into the plan yeah. here. We, we would obviously have to store the units 
give away the units, do something with them, but clearly it's not, that'll be That's a, the worst case scenario. That is the worst case scenario. Great, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And this give um, our unhoused residents um, dignity, respect, and, and security, and, and help them to get back on their feet. And I just want to say thank you for the great work. That's all I have. Great, thank you, Councilmember Dwan. Okay, Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you for all the work. Thank you just uh, to Serrato and his wife and uh, Mr. Serrato and his wife for all the uh, work they've, they've done to really uh, kick open the doors as it relates to financing some of these projects. Very appreciative of that. Thank you to the, to the residents that came in. I know some folks called in. I do have a few questions. Um, and Gigi, I wanted to ask you a few questions, but I'll wait to call you after I ask the team a, little, uh, a few questions. And, and one of them is, uh, you know, um, the memo that uh, uh, the mayor, me, uh, Councilmember Cohen, fully signed on to, you know, we, we, we touch on item two, develop a preference list. And I know, uh, Omar, you said that it's, it's something we're already doing. Can you tell me how the existing preference takes place? I'm trying to understand. I'm wondering if we're thinking about the same thing. And so, hmm. or someone, yeah. I can take that, Councilmember. Um, so the existing preference, we currently don't set a defined radius on purpose because we want to be as flexible and accommodating to both the neighborhood, the council office, and the people experiencing homelessness. And so when we set a defined radius, whether it's a mile, a mile and a half, whatever it is, there are instances where perhaps someone experiencing homelessness is right outside that radius. Um, and again, that's a situation where we wanna be as accommodating and flexible as possible. Also a defined radius in our experience doesn't necessarily um, coalesce with how a community might define their neighborhood. It is often not a exact right. radius, but people define their community in a lot of different ways. And so we wanted to, we currently don't have a defined radius because again, we wanna be accommodating to the community surrounding, whether it's safe parking or interim housing or BHC, right. we wanna be as accommodating to the community about how they define their own neighborhood and their own community. I understand. So that's sort of the focus that this memo is giving, right? Uh, that's not the way we currently do it. I guess I'm trying to understand Correct. how, what, what is the, separate from the radius, what is the current way that we or you all as a department sort of uh, implement the preference? Yeah, um, it, it varies by the site. And we typically work in coordination with the council office and the community advisory committee. Every interim housing site, uh, OWL, safe parking site has a community advisory committee. And that's the forum where we talk about what is, what is a radius, what's a map, what's a neighborhood. So for example, for the safe parking site, um, we actually define the, the neighborhood quite broadly and it's the entirety of council districts two and 10. For another site that recently just opened on the Alameda, we worked with the council office and that CAC to define a more narrow map of what the, what the boundary is. Yeah. But I guess when we say preference, I guess what I'm getting at is, and maybe I'm asking the question incorrectly, so my apologies, but are we, are, are we, it makes me think about enhanced outreach, I think is the language we've used in the past. Is that, is that the preference we're referring to? We do enhanced outreach, okay. proactive outreach, not reactive. We proactively are in that neighborhood. Um, right. And the, it's, yeah, I'll just, I'll yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess what I, I'll tell you what I, what comes to mind for me as I, as this memo was being prepared by my staff and I, and the, obviously the other offices. For me, preference means that uh, within the radius that we're going to go to X encampment and we're going to say, hey, Joe, Jan, Jane, we're opening this up down the street. We would like you to move there because it's an opportunity to get in there. 
that, that's what I would see as a preference and saying you're going to be, you're being, you are in the radius, you're being prioritized to go there. This is, in effect, for you and others in the area. That's the preference, that's the amount of touch that I would hope exists, rather yes. than, and I'm not suggesting, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand how it's currently done, but rather than just flyering, saying, hey, there's a location not too far from here, call this number if you're interested, and, and sort of this passive sort of touch, touch to, to the folks there. I'm, I'm interested in getting more active, sort of uh, very affirmative sort of, hey, Jan, Jane, Joe, this is this is where you got to go. It's yes. down the street. It's just it's 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 set. Yes, active. This is for you. Active is how I would define it. Okay. We ask outreach teams to be out there a set number of days and hours. Um, offers of the service are are made. Like, would there is an opportunity? Would you like to take advantage of it? I heard you mention the word flyer, and that makes me think of the RV safe parking area where um, we do, if we can't make contact with an individual who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness, we will leave a um, flyer or a business card saying we're trying to reach you, please get in touch. Um, so if there so was a flyer left in, in an, an encampment near this location, I would hope that the flyer says something like, hey, we actually have found a place for you call this number, I'm assu I assume people are going to be excited, okay, there's somewhere to go, let me call the number and sort of move them directly in there, right? And so, anyway, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, because I, I think, I want to make sure we're understanding this the same way, and so. Um, yeah, I think we could talk about what the flyer says I, 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 in I, I, maybe a different I, forum, but I would <laughs> say that the concern that I have is that when you create a um, this zone where you're saying any and all, please come inside and participate in the program, we have seen it um, draw other individuals from other parts of the city to come and set up their camp in that area. We've seen it in the Santa Teresa area for the RV supportive parking program. And so I would just want to be cautious and work through with you about what any communication and flyers. Yeah, would I was say. just using an example. I, I don't. I certainly. I don't have the resources or the time or the interest to be involved in developing a flyer. <laughs> you all are going to do that. You, that's what you all do, and it's important work. And yep. I, yeah, I, it was just an example of just trying to talking through live. Just trying to answer your yeah. question. No, I appreciate member. that. I appreciate that. But yeah, but so I wasn't trying to be super prescriptive. I Council was just, Member Jimenez, I, I would yes. just add, when I was talking about we already do that, I, I just meant that one of the things we've communicated to m many of the communities when we go to the community meetings is there will be a local preference for the site we're opening up in, in your community. So that there is the active outreach that Reagan talked about. I, th I thought that's what you were sort of getting at with that, that question, yeah, is okay. that we really do go out and make a concerted effort in the area where it's going to go. Okay, all right, very good. And, area then, and then loosely defined. Yeah, I appreciate that. And then with regard to 2, B, C, and D, uh, I totally understand that the city attorney's office needs to review it. Uh, I can tell you that some of the language that was put in the memo comes straight out of language that Mountain View uses. Um, not word for word, but and my team can give you further sort of thoughts as to what exactly is it, quite almost literally, I've been told, the cut and paste from something that they're actively doing. Um, and so what I'm curious, about, but it's fair that obviously the city attorney's office is going to look into this. How are we going to sort of hear back as it relates to some of the outcomes of the analysis to figure out whether B, C, and D is doable? Well, could we by default assume that it moves forward unless the city attorney brings us okay, this back in some form, whether under potential litigation or some other mechanism? Some other yeah, I think so. It, you know, it, as we move to the next step or don't move to the next step, there may be uh, info memo or some kind of communication if we really get get up against it and we need to say, well, hey, nothing's happening. You know, we'll we'll make sure that that gets communicated to council, I, and I, and that might be the right right mechanism for okay. it. Okay. All right. Cool. And, and and lastly, Gigi, would you? I know calling you up is, is probably the last thing you want, but can, can, would you mind coming up? I wanted to ask you a question. And it's tied to some of what we're talking about. Well, Gigi's coming up. I just need you to know, Councilmember, that the language you have 
included in your memo is not how our homeless system and our housing system defines a San Jose residency or affiliation. It is um, a physical address is one question we ask, but there are often for people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness and, and the trauma of it, um, an address is not the only determination of a San Jose affiliation. Um, it could be work, it could be school, it could be medical appointments. We ask a number of questions and I just have to say that um, because it's super important and I don't want to end up with direction that allow that hinders us and we aren't able to implement a program. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think Omar reached out with some language he related did. to that. Yeah, yeah, but obviously we had already submitted this, so any recommendations you have as it relates yeah, to, to modifying that, the language we can... Yeah, to, to that end, if, if yeah. we can, as it relates to um, where a person is from, if we can use the same San Jose affiliation that the supportive housing system in our region, city of our housing department, there, all uses, it will just make life easier for all that. I'm, I'm okay with okay. that. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah. So, so we submitted this after we got that, so I appreciate that. Great. Yes. Let me Great. check. Let me just check with the maker of the motion. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, go so, ahead. So thank you. Gigi, wonderful to see you again. I saw you out there and uh, uh, had a chance to visit and learn a little bit more about you and how long you've been on the street. We talked a little bit about your history. What, what, I'm, what I'm curious about is, well, not curious about, what I wanted to share with you what we're doing here. It may or may not be totally apparent, but Essentially, what we're saying is, and this is just, I'm just um, not going into all the details, but we're building a location not too far from where you're staying right now, right? Uh, the hope is once that's built, come mid next year, hopefully, that someone from the city, someone from outreach workers is going to come and say, Gigi, we have somewhere for you to go. It's actually down the street, right? What do you need, right, as a person currently living, you know, uh, on, on the street, unhoused, what do you need in, and what do you look for when you decide whether you actually want to move into that space? Um, I just want to get stable where I can go back to work. I want to just go back to being who I was before. And it's, it's possible, but it's not possible right now. But I try to make, make, make do as much as I can. Okay. Um, there's nothing special, just an ordinary, what one would move into a new place, starting a, a new chapter of your life would do. Me, just go in there, have positive um, feedback and everything from the workers that's provided with us. Okay. Would there be anything that you need from the city in order to be ready to move into a location? And maybe you need to think about it, and if you don't have an answer, that's okay. If you wanted to move in, what would you need? Like blankets, whatever, stuff to go into housing? Oh, okay. This is and, and if it's not too far from where you are now, right? It's literally half a mile away or whatever it is, right? And, and so what would you need for us, for you to say, you know what, city? Yeah, I'm actually going to go there. Yeah. Blankets and stuff that I, um, we don't have like that to be comfortable and set. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and I, I expect to go out there again and talk to you, so you can think about it. Uh, huh? I said I expect to maybe go out there and talk to you again, but I think you can spread the word to some of the folks in the area that mm -hmm. we're actually approving this, and mm -hmm. that at some point, someone from the city or an outreach worker is going to go out to that encampment on Great Oaks, and they're going to say, hey, everyone, we have somewhere for you to go. And so... Those conversations, my hope is that you pass it along to some of the gentlemen yes, that I met. I will. That, that it, it's going to be coming down the pipeline. It's a matter of just the timing. And so I would like you all to be ready, right? Because I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for, for you thank all. You. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And the reason I was asking Gigi those questions is what I'm curious about is is there anything that we as a city need to do to make sure that people, in the unhoused and these encampments, are housing ready, if you will? right, that are ready to go, uh, that we need to put in place prior to this even, to us even doing outreach to try to get them to relocate, if you will? 
just thoughts. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the term housing ready isn't necessarily a term we use because we use the term housing first where we believe all humans are ready for housing and need housing um, and that, you know, they need housing first before they can address any other um, issues or needs they have. Um, and all of our interim housing sites, we are low barrier, meaning we want to make it as easy as possible for people to participate. In this case, I would say the, um, what I would recommend is um, probably multiple um, points of touch time for outreach workers to build relationships and trust because so often, um, as Miss Gigi said herself, that um, I think people have been let down by our system and have had promises made that weren't fulfilled or went to other programs or shelters and had poor experiences. Um, and so having outreach with sufficient time for people to kind of build trust and really understand the needs of that particular human who's outside and suffering because Via del Oro may not be the solution for that human. They, ha they may have a disability um, or some other circumstance that makes Via del Oro not the right solution, but with enough time, we could work with that individual to find perhaps a location that is the right solution for them. Is there any way to empower the outreach workers that are currently on the street touching the residents, say, in this area, empower them with the knowledge that this is happening so that way they carry, they start carrying that message now rather than like a month before it's built? If is there... um, I, I no. would caution on that one at this point in time. What The recommendation we have in front of you today is to approve the cost benefit analysis and direct us to then work with Dignity and, and, the, and Swinerton team to negotiate a project delivery agreement and to bring that back to council for approval to build the project. And, you know, I, I think that is a critical step. I very much think we're going to be able to be successful in that process, but I don't think we should be at a point, you know, offering, you know, uh, beds and opportunities. We're going to do that as rapidly as we can. We're not looking at a long-term period. I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, but just th there are steps still to get to uh, the council approving a project delivery agreement appropriate in the funds and us going out and building it. So and there still will be a yeah. six-month period of construction to be able to conduct, I think, what you're talking about, council member. Yeah, so I, I, I just put that out for, for consideration. I totally YouTube. appreciate that. I, I recognize that. I know that we're getting, we're diving into the weeds a little bit, but I often think that these are the important conversations that we need to be having, and I'm not quite sure exactly when that would take place. And I think before we even go down the road and building this and trying to sort of develop and think about the contours of how this is going to work. I think that's important. Obviously. And that could be Tyler and fine. I just want the council and yeah. the other staff members to know that's something to, to bear in mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are just thoughts. I mean, even the word <laughs> housing ready, I just, just came up with that as I was thinking about it. I, it wasn't, yeah. So yeah. I understand that. Uh, I, I think the sweet spot that we've found is typically three months, sometimes even six months before a site opens where we would want to start that proactive, regular outreach. Um, also, um, people living outside their circumstances change. It's very dynamic. They may move yeah. around. So it's finding, again, kind of that sweet spot of um, the appropriate time. There is one, uh, excuse me, just one quick thing I think is really important when you ask about what the city needs uh, interim housing, all of these solutions that we're talking about, they, they, they involve an, an input, right, this outreach that you're talking about, which requires cost, right, requires us to make decisions and sometimes trade-offs. And so I just want to make sure that as we're kind of thinking about this, what we need when Reagan talks about the outreach teams needing time to deliver that space, Sometimes that means that we need more outreach workers. Sometimes it means that we need, and so as you get into, you know, your, your subsequent deliberations, thinking about where we want to allocate our resources, I just think it's important for all of the council to sort of be aware that to, to do these well, 
we, we are going to have to figure out how to make sure they're all resourced in the way we need them, to your point. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'll just end with just this very comment, I know I've gone over time, is that, you know, I ask questions, other folks ask questions, we're all on the same team, we all want the same thing. Um, I'm just simply asking questions to try to sort of dig a little deeper and try to better understand some of the stuff. And so uh, I just want you to know that it's coming from, I, I think, a good place. I'm not trying to poke holes in anything or question anything. It's more trying to understand how we're going to move forward. Um, I think oftentimes, for years, we've been sort of at a distance. We say, go do this, and we sort of step back and not really engage. And I think that time's over. I think many of us need to engage more fully in some of these. And so that's really what I'm attempting to do. So. Thank you. It's healthy and appreciated, yeah. and we're here whenever you need us. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Jimenez. I, I appreciate your questions. I, th I think the implementation details really matter, and um, as they say, the devil's in the details, right? So it's, it's important for us to be able to ask specific questions and really understand and practice how things are getting done and what we're learning out in the field, which is always, always evolving and helping us to refine our approach. Um, okay, we are going to go to Council Member Cohen next. Thank you. Um, I want to start th by thanking Councilmember Jimenez for the line of questioning. Even though, obviously, as, as Jim said, this is we're not there yet on this site. These are the kind of questions that we ask ourselves, I think, almost every day in our council offices, and it's important for us to express them regularly. And I'm sure we've asked the same questions at many ones, at many of these meetings. Um, and they're not. There's no easy answers, but the soon, the more we express them, the more maybe we can think together about what the right answers are. Because I, I'm not sure any of us know what the right answers are. Um, I want to thank Gigi for being here. I think it's important for us to hear the demand for these sites and the fact that, that we know there's people who, for whom the site is a, is a low barrier. There's a low barrier to the site. As long as there's an option, people will take it. Um, but I, I mean, I think part of the line of the questioning of Councilmember Jimenez was there are people for whom that's not true. There are people who, when offered a site, say, no, I prefer not to go to that site. And I, and I think that Obviously, you know, Gigi can't answer the question for people who might say no or might be, have more difficulty. So, I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't want to ask it now, but for, for Reagan and others, w for us to understand as a council, what are those barriers? Why do people tell us no? And what can we do to prepare situations where more people are likely to say yes? I think that's the conversation that I'd like to have and I imagine others here would like to have. So that. You know that's the that's the challenge right now. Um, I've always been uncomfortable, as as um, many people know from past discussions that we've had, when we start talking about geographic preferences. I understand that we want local preference, and a local preference is important. And we also know that people on the streets prefer local options, so they're important for in in multiple ways. But it's not always as clear cut, and Reagan, you were making this point, as this, this radius or this neighborhood deserves, or this, this particular encampment, because it happens to be closer, is the one that needs to be first addressed. And I think that that, that, that decision maybe does depend on where they're being built, what the circumstances of that community are, and maybe in some of these areas, the circumstances are such that it is important to look immediately adjacent right away. But I will, I will make the case because I'm in a different circumstance in District 4. We've, we're opening a site up at Cerrone. Uh, presumably now we're on target for that and we'll have some discussions with you so offline about the progress there. Um, but I would argue that there's sites, you know, this is the only site really within like an eight mile or four mile radius or eight miles almost available to people anywhere in District 4. Um, and there are, probably, there are some sites I can think of that are eight miles from Cerrone that should be first on the list and sites that are within a quarter mile of Cerrone that might not even, that might not rise to that important level. So I just want us to think as a council about allowing some local thoughtfulness about where are the right places to address. We've been telling people in certain areas to be patient with us as we find locations, um, but we can't always find locations in all areas that are gonna be close enough to some of the really important sites that we have to clean up. So I think that, I just wanna express my concern with continuing to have the conversation just about vicinity as opposed to a thoughtful approach to what are the right sites. There might be some sites really close by that are important, and some sites that are really close by that frankly, you know, we can say for now we're gonna leave this one because it's not, you know, it, it's not as urgent for environmental um, 
you know, impact on neighborhoods. For whatever reason, there's some sites that are more impactful than others. So I just, I, I want to make sure that we keep that in mind. Until we have enough sites where everybody is able to be placed, we have to be thoughtful about where we. Thank you for that, Councilmember Cohen. And I will say, I think there will be time at a, a future session to, to delve into that. We are exploring, continuing to explore relationships with our county partners that will uh, lead to partnerships where we don't have as much of that local uh, piece, but we get the benefit of the additional operational support. So I think right. we, we do have to have that complicated conversation. I think ideally it looks like this one is headed in a direction, and, and I look forward to, to uh, us coming back and, and having that more robust conversation about balance, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the direction of this memo just with making the point that this memo applies to this site. It's not necessarily a statement of council about the general applicability of these particular criteria for all the sites that we'll be just moving forward with across the city. Um, and so anyway, that, I think that's, that, that's really the only point I wanted to make was just to be thoughtful about how we're going to do this and, and, and be able to be, um, apply things differently when needed in different parts of the city. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member, and agreed, and why I also referenced the importance of, of taking a site-specific approach and thinking about that context. I think you're, you're absolutely right there. Um, okay, we are back around to Councilor Batra, and Councilor Batra, as you speak, I also just, I wanna <coughs> clarify my understanding of recommendation five from our, our joint memo um, as BD 23 from the, the June message, which was approved by the council, um, not being overridden by this. So those $350,000 for enhanced services, I think the point of the memo is those dollars are in place to enhance the area around these sites. So I just, I wanted to make sure that was clear. This doesn't take away our ability to provide that around other EIHs, for example. Okay. So go ahead, council yeah. member, your uh, yeah. floor is yours. So I, I just want to clarify one point there are two encampments near this area. So like um, uh, Council Member Cohen said that, hey, we're talking about uniquely what we are doing for this site. Some of the things we do here may not be applicable broadly. So for this site, there are two encampments nearby and we, the community expects that those encampments would have with local preference they will be the ones who will get housed there. And those are pretty small encampments, so 150 should be plenty of room for these people to be there. And then the second expectation is that once we have been able to successfully get them there, there will be attempt to have no re-encampment or keep it encampment free. With, this, with the effort which will be put in there in that area. Um, and, and I think that's what the expectation is. That's what is at the best attempt to effort because that's what is stated in item number three on my memo or our memo. So I just want to make sure that uh, community is very supportive of this innovative approach with that understanding and we are going to make our neighborhood better than what it was or equal or better or not so equal and better and that's what we have to deliver so when we are looking at it the work we are doing from the staff side it is the success is not being able to construct these units 150 units at that lower cost it is really being able to operate that site with the neighborhood and the unsheltered being equally happy. So, so that's the criteria and we have said that we, we, that is what's going to allow us to really expand our activity for other people. And let's try to do our best to make that happen. I just want to re-stress that, that the uh, what the criteria of success is, okay? Uh, okay. Ms. Passon, if you want to make any comment on that one, or you agreeable or disagreeable. Council member, did, did you, maybe you could formulate a question for staff if you have one. Okay, so the question would be is, are, is our success criteria for this site is being able to build the 150 units, be able to occupy them, 
and keep the neighborhood to be better based on the data uh, which you're going to be providing under item number one. Council Member, I, I think that our, our, our goal with all our sites, this one included, since that's what we're talking about, is to, is to improve the community by helping people have a place uh, to be, improve their life by getting them into, into housing and, and make sure to keep it clean. Keep, keep it clean. And I, we've got uh, Director John Cicerelli from our Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services Department, but I think that that's, that's our expectation that we'll be able to do some of that. John, do you want to add? Yeah, I think you're... Um I think your memo actually mentions the enhanced services for those communities. Um, so this would be subject to that as well, and that is a proactive process, meaning we don't, we're not going to wait for people to call us, although we will certainly respond to those inquiries, but we will have a proactive route. We're out there twice a week, every week, looking for all the, any kind of dumping, any kind of other issues, graffiti, those kind of things, um, so that we're there pretty consistently. I will point out that Vio del Oro, if the site, even if it goes up really quickly, the money for that enhanced service is only one year worth of funding. It will run out by the end of June of this fiscal year. So there won't be that money there by the time Via del Oro is built unless we, we reappropriate that. So your standard service itself makes the neighborhood better than, equal or better than what it was. And that services take you a step beyond. I'm just talking about is being able to deliver that level of service, what you call standard service, and, and making the neighborhood look equally, equal or better than before. That, that's the expectation. Anything beyond you do, that's the gravy, that's the compliments part. So, so that's all the expectation setting is. Yep, and we're ready for that expectation and we will be collecting the data to be able to show you the before and after, what did we find before the site went in, how are things going, on all the sites, by the way, once, because this program isn't up and running yet, it's not, it's probably not ready to go till just before the end of the year, say December, but we'll do all the existing sites and then if the appropriation lives on beyond the fiscal year, we would add Via del Oro to that, but we'll be collecting all that data of how that process works, what we're learning. And, and you know, we could learn, hey, we need more help, we need more resources, we could learn, we're, we can handle it. Um, but we'll be coming back to talk to you about that once we've kind of lived through that experience for a while. Okay, so thank you. As long as that's the goal, we are good. Thank you. Great, thank you, council member. Okay, let's vote. Oh, I know Councilmember Jimenez is going to want to vote on this okay. one. We're going to hold the vote for the council member. There it is. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Great job, everyone. It's exciting. Thank you. Okay. We are on to open forum, which is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on city business that was not on today's agenda. Jordan Maldo in person. And um, maybe Cole Cameron, but I think that person left. But Cole Cameron and Jordan Maldo. Hi, Jordan Maldo, District 3. Any conversation about traffic congestion at large events isn't complete unless we're talking about transit and active transportation options as well. This weekend, I had the opportunity to join the Bicycle Coalition biking along the Guadalupe River to go to the Day on the Bay event. It was a lot of fun. Once we got there, we saw cars circling around looking for scant parking spaces. Um, it would have been great if even more people took the opportunity to bike there along with us or if people had options to take public transportation there. Whenever we have large events like Day on the Bay, Bark in the Park, other big um, centerpiece events for the city. It would be great if the city could work with VTA to get more frequent bus routes that are going on that day or maybe stand up temporary one day bus routes to get people to these events and tell people about them so that they know they can avail themselves of these options rather than trying to drive there. If one wanted to bike to these events, 
Sometimes the bike coalition is there to provide um, supervised bar bike parking, but that's not always possible. All of the sites around the city where people want to gather, there should be ample bike parking, at least as much as there is car parking, but ideally much more. But right now, it's usually the reverse. Um, so I'd like to see DOT, the Parks and Rec Commission, and the City Council all working to increase the amount of bike parking at our various destinations around the city, and also just regular commercial districts like Santa Clara Street as well. Um, there was also conversation about the load rider event um, on the um, rotunda outside. It would be great if the city could also um, encourage active transportation culture in addition to car culture. For example, there was a bike show, the Sunnyside Up bike show over at History Park back in June. It would be great if events like that could also take up the city rotunda and activate City Hall and downtown. Thank you. Surrender. Hi, I have a lot of time since I don't have my son with me. Um, so I wanted to talk a couple of items. Uh, one is the housing for students in downtown. Um, I worked in downtown San Jose in a liquor store from since I was 11 until I was about 23. Why your government let me do that, I don't know. Uh, but I consider myself an expert in downtown. And so as we continue to develop it, I hope we do not see more smoke shops and more vaping shops and more alcohol sh places and more liquor licenses so that the police can actually um, work on making sure what is already there is um, being sold properly instead of just adding more problems for them. Um, cannabis lounges, I think, would be much better because we are in another depression. Um, you can call it inflation or whatever you want, but most people are in depression. Um, I went to jail again last week, uh, Thursday night. Why? Because I choose to. Um, it was a horrible experience. Um, I went to a low uh, security facility. I think there was about 50 women there. I talked to many of them. Many of them are mothers. They're there for various reasons, missing court dates, whatever it may be. Um, some of them have, one of had lost already about 20 pounds because the food is not good. Um, and in the morning, they line up about 25 of them each to get their little cup of pills for whatever it is. Some of them walk around like they're zombies. Um, that, these are not solutions, and I, saw, I felt it was very inhumane. Um, so yeah, hope to see my son again soon. Oh. I'll also be filing a lot of civil lawsuits. Thanks. Tony followed by Blair. Okay, moving on to Blair, followed by Sobrato. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, I guess for my open forum, uh, to mention, uh, you know, in the work that I'm doing down in San Diego at this time towards uh, towards uh, smart street light accountability issues, uh, it's a lot of important stuff. With the recent uh, uh, Israeli uh, war with war in Israel uh, and Gaza area, uh, I, I, I'm really concerned, I'm saddened that, you know, for the events that have happened, and that here at the local level, that um, as always, when war happens, when war breaks out, we have a way to kind of eventually meld into kind of a war frame of mind. And with the work I'm doing in San Diego and the work that I try to do in San Jose, you know, we really, really can address the future of war <laughs> and really, really ask for ideas of peace and and uh, as terms of open democracy and participatory democracy, I think those are the ways to really fight the concepts of war. And when we're building our technology future, if we practice it in terms of open democracy and, and participation and, and ideas of uh, sustainability, that's building peace. And that sends an important message out the work, what we're trying to develop at the local level. Other local areas try to emulate and develop that. And behold, we'll soon be asking uh, for a better reason in our world. 
So, you know, I, I just hope that uh, the work that I'm doing with tech accountability can really be taken seriously what its long-term goals can address and, uh, and work towards. And that with the sad events that are happening in Israel right now, that you really note, uh, make, note your decision-making at this time and really work towards ideas of peace. And, and don't when you see ideas of war coming in, put it aside and, and work towards peace and society. Sobrato followed by Matthew. Sobrato fangirl, just to be accurate. Um, I just want to, <clears throat> all the conversation today was about, um, <clears throat> part of it was punishing unhoused people who are camping near um, new sites, um, but nothing was about what we're gonna do to make providers accountable or to find new providers. And if you want these new sites, and you, the question was, how do we make people more interested in these new sites? How do we make people want to take what we're offering? You need more providers. You need providers. You need to get rid of lousy providers. You need to bring in good providers. That's how you get people to, to be more interested in this. Because you've already seen the outreach numbers are dismal for these providers. So bring in new people and stick to case managers. Have case managers stick around for a long time. When people have case managers leave, they feel like nobody loves me, nobody cares, and they don't want to keep telling people over and over and over again, this is who I am, these are my needs, this is what I want. They need case managers that will stay with them and follow through on what they asked for. That's what people need. That's how you get people interested. That's how you keep people interested. But all your interest was focused on how to keep unhoused people away from these projects if they don't accept them, how to punish them and banish them from the area rather than banishing poor service providers who are not providing the services that our tax dollars are paying for. So I'd like to see a meeting where you guys focus on the lousy service providers that you keep funding because that's really the crux of the issue as to why we still have people out on the streets. It's lousy service providers. Thank you. Matthew, followed by an, followed by Rudy, sorry. Good evening. And uh, I'd like to start by saying hail Hitler. Uh, Mark That's not city business. We're an open and inclusive city that provides services to all of our residents. Um, Rudy. Good evening. Can all of you hear me? Yes. Perfect, fantastic. First off, I would like to uh, thank the city council for taking their time out of their public meeting here to go and speak and listen to all of us here. And um, I go by he, him pronouns, and I'd also like to state Black Lives Matter translate. That's not, okay. Anon? Hi, um, my name is Anam. Um, I wanted to raise an appeal from Representative Cory Bush to our city council. Um, the last week has weighed heavily on the hearts of Israelis, Palestinians, and anyone with a sense of humanity. The loss of 1,400 Israeli civilians is painful. This does not justify the cruel and unjust retaliation on Palestinian civilians. 2,750 Palestinians have died, more than 800 of those being children. More than 6,000 bombs have been released on the Gaza Strip, which is smaller than the city of San Jose, with more than twice the people. This level of right, this, 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 this is not related, related to city business. Okay, so that's not related to city business. Um, if you have something related to city business, you can unmute yourself. Hey, okay, Mary. You hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So I wanted to talk about, uh, or first I wanted to say that the uh, last three callers actually, um, I, I, I'd caution you because I'm a resident of San Jose um, and I caution you that uh, cutting them off, uh, there was a, a man in uh, Los Angeles, Mr. Michael Hunt. Uh, he he was horrible and, and had a wore like a Ku Klux Klan robes to the uh, city council meeting uh, and they kicked him out and, and he was able to sue 
And because they knew they'd lose, they settled for two hundred fifteen thousand dollars. And I don't, I, I, I would really hate to see important money lost um, to that. So I, I would say, be careful when you cut people off. Uh, you're opening yourself up to to a lawsuit, a uh, federal lawsuit under forty two USC nineteen eighty three, and a state lawsuit under the Brown Act. Um, so just be careful. Anyways, I, uh, back to what we were saying about. Uh, Israel, yeah, I think that the city needs to put forward a resolution. So I'm calling for a resolution. This is city business to condemn the Zionist occupation of Palestine um, and recognize that that uh, that Jews did 9/11. Jews are responsible. Kyle, 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 hello. Yes. All right, perfect. Um, the Holocaust never happened. Jews did 9-11. That's not city business. Okay, Anon? No, we already already called that person, and I so Lev is the only person left who I have not called. Um, yeah, the Second Amendment protects the first, but I'd like the city to put a resolution forward to ban uh, all these artificial flavors and sucralose and all this junk that's in the food. It's all just a bunch of goy slop. And you wonder why everybody's fat and retarded. It's because the Jews. That is not city business. Okay, back to council. Okay, we're adjourned.